I have with me uh, Cambridge's resident expert on Wittgenstein and all things history of analytic philosophy, and that is Professor Michael Potter. Professor Michael, welcome. Hi. So I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, Michael before we get going. So uh, Michael is the Professor of Logic at Fitzwilliam College, and he's a Life Fellow there. He's written a book on uh, the Notes on Logic, uh, Wittgenstein's Notes on Logic. He has uh, a book in the works on some of Wittgenstein's ideas about ethics and religion. And then he has um, a book that came out more recently that I have, which is about um, the rise of analytic philosophy, which is about um, all of the early analytics and, and how they relate to each other and uh, biographical elements as well. So that's um, Frege, Russell, uh, Wittgenstein and Ramsey. So um, hopefully we'll be able to talk to um, Professor Michael about uh, some of these other thinkers as well in the future. But um, today is today's all about Wittgenstein. Um, and um, so I'm sure you guys are looking forward to that. Right, so let's get going. I think the first thing I'd like to ask you about, Michael, is um, Wittgenstein's sort of overall appeal. Because um, before I even was a philosopher and I didn't know anything about philosophy, he was one of the few philosophers I'd actually heard of. And that was because um, in, in a, an episode of The Simpsons, Homer is trying to impress, um, you may know about this bit, I don't know, he's trying to impress an attractive lady and so he trying to be pretend to be sophisticated, he name drops Wittgenstein. And so um, in our family, whenever we wanted to sound sophisticated or pretentious, we would name drop Wittgenstein, not knowing anything about him at all. Um, and I think that's really unusual for an analytic philosopher, especially. I mean, I can't think of any other analytic philosopher that has sort of broad repeal, really, um, than, than Wittgenstein. And I think because of that, um, he has a tendency to, to mean that people study him rather than just an area he worked on, like philosophy of language or something, or logic. They, they, they want to study him, his sort of broader thought, his thinking. Um, and, and actually, while I'm talking, when I was an undergraduate, um, there was only one paper you could take that was based on, on an individual philosopher, and that was a Wittgenstein paper. There, there was nothing else that was just um, isolated like that. So um, why, do you think, why do you think that is? Why does he have that kind of appeal? I think one reason is I mean, you, you, you identified him clearly as an analytic philosopher, but of course that's disputed. I mean, particularly in his later work, there's no doubt that the Tractatus in his early period is clearly in the analytic tradition, but some of his later work is seen by many as fighting against elements of the analytic tradition. So I think he's a philosopher that, that cuts across those boundaries. I think another reason is his distinctive style of writing, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about again later in the interview because it's so relevant yeah. to understand it. This method he had of writing in, in sound bites, really, in, in short, very short paragraphs, he hardly wrote anything in his entire corpus that any of us would recognize as an argument in the way that we read them in all other, in virtually every other philosopher. Um, I mean, about the only case would be his lecture on ethics in 1929. That was, he wrote that as a lecture. So that has an argumentative thread running through it. A little bit, the blue book and the brown book, which he wrote in English for his students in Cambridge. Um, so in fact, the lecture on ethics and the blue and brown book are also unusual that he wrote them in English. All his other philosophy he wrote in German right through his life. He always did philosophy in German. But these three exceptions are pieces that have arguments in them. So because he, apart from them, he wrote in this, in series of sound bites, that's great for people who are not philosophers to dip into. You can find a, a, a Wittgenstein book in a bookshop and just open it and in the middle and find a couple of sentences that resonate with you. You, you know, you can't do that with a critique of pure reason, just open it in the middle and, you know, Halfway yeah. through the mental deduction, I thought, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Whereas so, Bitcoin so, does. Yeah, so do you think then that sort of, because that sort of shorter form, these idea of pithy statements or kind of sharp ideas, I mean, it's very, that's quite a, a recent thing that we, we, we start to, you know, um, look at tweets or, or short blog posts or these sort of trying to get this punchy idea. Have you, do you think there's anything 
kind of particularly modern or postmodern about Wittgenstein? Has he got a later, has he become more popular recently, do you think? Or You just give me an idea. There probably is already. Is there a Wittgenstein tweet a day account? I, I I am not on Twitter, Michael. I have to, I have to say that the format is just too short for me to 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 to, to be interested in that. But not too short for Wittgenstein. It, it's like yes. for Wittgenstein. Yeah. Um, well, it does it's... seem that it does seem that 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 um it that, that things like philosophy quote he's quite quotable, I would think. So so the philosophy quotes seem to do well on things like um things like Twitter and and, and TikTok and bits and pieces, yeah. from what I gather. Yeah. And, and the risk, of course, is people quote him out of context. Hmm. And you see quotes from Wittgenstein in people writing in the philosophy of law or the philosophy of psychology or in, in very widely differing areas, sometimes taken completely out of context, not remotely <laughs> meaning what the person who uses the quote thinks it means, but yeah. he, he can be used like that. So is he postmodern? Um, He's used by postmoderns, undoubtedly. I don't think he himself was or saw himself as postmodern. I mean, the thing here is that in his later work, particularly, he's seen as trying to as trying to destroy certain ways of doing philosophy. In his early work, he also wants to destroy in, slightly, in a slightly different way. But yeah. that, I suppose, resonates with some postmodernists. Um, I think my resistance to just say, oh, yeah, treat him as a postmodern philosopher is that I think the danger is it makes his criticisms too easy. I mean, if you look at the reasons why he thinks that some tra traditional strands in philosophy are mistaken, they're actually quite detailed reasons. They're reasons that you need to under, really think about and understand. They're not just, oh, this is easy. We can just, here's a way of just sweeping away whole vast swathes of philosophy uh, trivially. Mm, so I think mm, mm. if you treat it as a, as a trivial uh, takedown, you don't get to the essence of it. Mm, mm. Yeah, well, I've, I've found that's, that's definitely the case when you start to study philosophy a bit more. Um, you, you begin to appreciate... Uh, why things have been done a certain way and, and rather than the exuberance of youth that just tries to <laughs> smash everything down and start something new. But I wondered if there's another sort of appeal with Wittgenstein um, in that, I mean, you'd mentioned to a, li a little bit before that the fact that most of his writings are not in our standard sort of um, structural argument, uh, written in sort of structured argument, that he has a certain element of mystery there. Uh, this idea of there being some kind of esoteric or deep wisdom hidden in those pages and in, in the in the funny numbered paragraphs or whatever as well. And and so it draws you to study him as it might draw you to be interested in, say, ancient Egypt or something or or, 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 or religious texts. That there, there there's some something mysterious there drawing you in, which would be different to say, say a Ramsey or a Frege who tried to put everything on the page. Yes, I'm I'm sure that's right. And I'm sure he encouraged that, particularly yeah. with the mystical element that he added to the Tractatus in the, in late, the later revisions of it. So in the towards the end of the Tractatus, in the Sixes, there are se several very mystical sounding sentences, which are the kind of pe things that people like to quote. Mm. And, of course, the famous Proposition Seven, you know, where often cannot speak. You know, that that mm. sounds mystical and the kind of thing you could say while standing on a mountaintop looking into the into the into the infinity you know um and i certainly don't want to downplay though that that's an important element in wittgenstein that, mm. um and trying to understand it is and get full philosophical weight out of it is is difficult um but i think that the danger, of course, is that that kind of thing can be used by anyone. You know, you can use it for any uh, aim in pursuit of almost any aim because it is so uh, hard to pin down. Mm -hmm. Do you think that might partly be um, because uh, so Wittgenstein seemed to have a kind of a what 
he had a relationship with religion, didn't he? I mean, it was he, he had certain respect for it at least, um, and an interest in it that say I, I don't see in Frege and Russell, for example. Um, and and so I wonder if maybe that might be related to his rather than see anything that's might even whiff of the the mystical or, or the transcendent. Um, he he seemed to be a bit more comfortable in having that on the page. Do you think? Well, I'll disagree with you about one thing. You said Frege and Russell. I mean, Frege just didn't, didn't write about uh, philosophy of religion. Um, I mean, he mentioned the concept of God a couple of times, but, you know, he's not a philosopher of religion. Russell, um, he's famous for why I'm not a Christian. Yes. But actually, he had a couple of, of religious phases in his life. It, with Russell, it seemed to be just a question of which woman he was seeing at the time, you know. Uh, he was influenced in Russell curiously was influenced enormously by the people he interacted with. He he bounced around between different views, um, you know, in, in, in a very strange way over his over his career. But he certainly had a mystical a mystical period. You kind of get you get a sense a little bit with Russell. He just got bored um, with, with with his current philosophical thinking. I mean, so you, I mean, you see you see him from. I mean, you mentioned in your book uh, that there's sort of the early idealist side of him that, that's been traced in some some good books as well. Um, his 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 uh, relationship with McTaggart and and then and then his sort of fight against it with Moore yeah. and um, yeah. And when you look at his theories on judgment or whatever, they they change all the time. Um, I wonder if it's part of the th sort of a strange thrill seeking. And then he moved away from metaphysics as well um, and got political. <laughs> Well, he did live a long time. He had long, yeah. plenty of time to change his mind, I suppose. But yeah. 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 But as for Wittgenstein, yes, you're right. He had a, a deep respect for an interest in religion, right through um, from. Well, he famously had what he himself thought of it as a mystical experience in 1909 um, when he was watching a play in Vienna, and the. One of the characters on stage talked about um, having a feeling of safety, of being completely safe. And at that moment, Wittgenstein in the audience had an overwhelming feeling of being safe. And he referred back to that experience he'd had in 1909 many times later in his life. So, for example, in the Electron Ethics, he explicitly mentions the feeling of complete safety as, as a, something that has a kind of religious dimension to it. But I think the key to understanding his views about religion is to think about that kind of experience. Because, of course, when he had this feeling of complete safety, that doesn't mean a kind of empirical safety that means you don't have to bother looking both ways when you cross the road. You know, the, the, what a, a religious person who isn't crazy thinks means by... Um, trust in God is a kind of some deep sense of trust that in the end things will work out okay. Not a, a thing that means that if you're in a trench in the war, you can just stick your head up yeah. and not get shot. You know, it's, it's not that. It's not an empirical um, feeling of God moving things around you so that you won't trip over. It's not that kind of thing. No, it's sort of a more of a sense of uh, that the, the reality is ultimately benevolent in some sense, or reality is ultimately um, on your side and not out to get you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, so we've talked a little bit about Wittgenstein's personality or his approach or his broader broader thinking, and I think um, so. I'm, I, I can say a little bit about what I know, but uh, I'm, well, I would might happy for you to correct me. I'm sure you will. So um, he's, he's he's quite an eccentric person, isn't he? If you look at his personal life, um, uh, I mean, I'd be interested to know if you think he may have had some sort of somewhere on the autism spectrum or or, or not. I'll, I'll I'll just leave that up to you to feel. But there's he's 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 a very sort of strong personality. I've heard lots of different anecdotes about him brushing up with various other members at Cambridge during his time there. Um, how does he his personality and maybe a bit about his biography uh, affect his work? And, and do you think that that it's relevant to understand that when you when you're trying to get into his mind? Um, he, he is an interesting personality. I mean, his biography is fascinating. Uh, he 
did so many different things in his life. I mean, the idea of someone just designing a house, just one house, and then moving on, you know. So briefly, he described himself as an architect while he was designing this house for his sister in Vienna. Um, but then he just he went moved on and did and did other things. Um, so he had a remarkable uh, breadth to to his abilities. I think um, I would say that the main way in which he, he, his personality is relevant to understanding his philosophy is not so much in things like whether he was a very demanding friend, which he plainly was. He he put lots of demands on the people around him. He depended on their understanding and support on, on many occasions. I think it's more that one has to understand his methods of, of doing philosophy, um, but also the way he thought. That I would characterize him as not an elaborate thinker. The fact that he could deliver his philosophy in these short sound bites um, is an indication of the way he thought. What he did was he thought about a topic until he saw into its essence. And when he did see into its essence, some conclusion would just come upon him as just clearly right. And once it had come upon him as clearly right, he wrote it down, and then he didn't bother putting giving the reasons. So he didn't work. And that's not, I think, because he wanted to be deliberately obscure. It's that he didn't know the reasons. That's not how he thought. He thought by a series of insights. Um, that's part of it. The other part of it is that because he had this method of keeping a journal, right through his philosophical life, he would keep a journal um, in which every day he would try to do some philosophy and write down perhaps just one sentence or a paragraph, a few sentences. And then his method was, you've got a stack of journals with all these short insights. How do you turn those into a book? Well, the method he used in the 1930s was he would um, copy remarks from his notebooks into a uh, typescript. He would get them typed up by a typist. Then he would cut up these typescripts into little slips and rearrange them and then sometimes paste them into another book or get them typed up again. And so some of these typescripts have survived and so one can follow the process as he tries to assemble what eventually became the Philosophical Investigations, which he left to be published after he died. Um, but one can see the method of revision. Now, for the Tractatus, he uses essentially the same method. It's just that because it was done during wartime, um, he couldn't keep having new typescripts made. So he had to do it in a slightly different way. But in essence, it's the same. So we have this big volume, generally known as the Proto-Tractatus, which is the, the first, the, the earlier, uh, the early draft of the book, in which he transcribed remarks from his journals into this book. And then he gave them decimal numbers. And in the first instance, that decimal numbering system was just a method of telling the typesetter what order to put the remarks in the eventual book, because that wasn't the same as the order in which he copied them from the notebook into the project track papers. Mm. So it's, it's a method of doing what we now call, well, we still call it cut and paste on the computer, whereas it's not actually pasting, that, but yeah. it used to be cut you know, with scissors and paste with glue. Yeah. And Wittgenstein was doing that um, in wartime circumstances and using decimal numbering to achieve the cut and paste uh, function, if you like. Mm. So, mm. so this is all rather long-winded, but to go back to your question, the reason one needs to understand these processes is you need to understand the different statuses of the different bits of his nachlas, um, you know, all of which is now available online. Um, there's a wonderful resource um, uh, maintained at Bergen, where you can search all his nachlas. So if you want to find his uses of a certain word uh, throughout his nachlas, you type it into the, the the online system and it searches and it gives you all the instances anywhere in his nachlas 
of that word or phrase. So it's yeah. wonderful. Uh, so Nashlas so, is his collected works after he dies is all put yeah, together for research. German for, for, it's left behind. It's, it's, it's yeah. the, the manuscripts you've left behind when you die. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, and in that uh, vast set of notebooks that have survived, you know, a lot of stuff has been published and a lot of stuff gets quoted, but one has to be, pay attention to whether what you're quoting is from the investigations of the Tractatus, that's kind of top level, or from one of the typescripts, that's the next level down, or from one of the notebooks. If you quote from the notebooks, stuff that didn't make it into the final edit, then you have to ask, well, why didn't it make it into the final edit? Sometimes it's because <laughs> it's rubbish. You know, he wrote stuff that's just clearly wrong, and which I'm sure the day after he wrote it in his journal, he realized was wrong. And so the danger is you just take a sentence out of one of the journals and says, right, that's what Wittgenstein thought. Well, it's what he thought for a couple of hours until the following day he realized it was stupid. Um, so yeah. you have to pay attention to the different levels of, of, uh, of, of his material. Uh, if you're trying to, I mean, it depends what purpose you want to use him for, but if you're trying to understand the, you know, him as, a, as the best version of Wittgenstein you can find, yeah. that I think you have to respect his his editing process in, in front of him. So I mean he but he only actually published the Tractatus, didn't he? So what how how did people he left he, he left the investigations at his death in a finished state and you know and it was Anscombe who managed the process of getting it published. Um Anscombe who had known him well in his last few years and she he made her one of his literary executors. So it has authority as a book he intended to be published, whereas all the other ones from the 1930s that have been published, um, he left in various states. So Philosophical Remarks is certainly he, he edited and it is in a relatively finished state. Um, Blue Book, he um, produced and authorised it to be given to students in Cambridge and he sent copies of it to Russell and Moore and so on. So it has some authority, you know, kind of next level down. Whereas um, the remarks on the foundations of mathematics, some parts of that are just extracts from his journals. Um, so there are some parts of that which are very mixed quality. Um, and one has to recognize that and not pretend, you know, remarks on the foundations of maths is not a finished book by Wittgenstein. It's got yeah. very interesting things in it, but it's not, it doesn't have the same status as the investigations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think it's going to be good to start to get into some of his thought and how his early thought and his later thought interact and change. Um, but if you were going to, so we talked, if we're just going to sort of finish up talking about him as a person, his biography, what do you think are the main things about him that would be good for anyone who wanted to study his work to know? So, I mean, you mentioned one about the way in which he wrote how he compiled his thoughts together. So that's important. Um, and uh, as, as is known, he, and you'd mentioned that he wrote the Tractatus in the Trenches. I mean, do you think that had any impact on the, on the sort of stuff he wrote? Um, yeah. So, so, so he wrote it in the trenches. I think the popular impression is that he was actually writing it in a trench with shells coming down on him. I don't think he did that. Um, I'm pretty confident that during the, the campaigning season, when he went out into the, the trenches, into the, onto the Eastern Front, um, he would take with him one notebook. Um, he, he, his general method was he would leave most of his notebooks, including after, by 1916, the, the Proto-Tractatus volume, which he was by then compiling, he would leave them for safekeeping, either in Vienna or in Olmutz, which is where his regiment was based. So, that, you know, if he died, one notebook would would fall into the mud on the Eastern Front. His other notebooks were back in safekeeping. And indeed, there's a sheet of paper that survived from beginning of 1917, when he was just about to go off to come for the, to the campaign again. Um, instead of the campaign, which is now enormously uh, uh, hor horribly relevant, re resonant, because of course, he, the Eastern Front, he was fighting in what was, is now Ukraine. Um, mm. So the war that's that, that's going on now is is just a, is in some ways a replay um, of, 
of, of, of that. Um, but uh, he left behind the sheet of paper where he gave instructions to his sister on what to do with his manuscripts in the event of his death. And he, he lists the, the, the notebooks and says, you know, these, this one is to be sent to his, his friend, Pinsent. Th th these ones are to be sent to Russell at Trinity. You know, this one's to be published. You know, he left that kind of set of instructions. Um, so that shows that his method was, I think, to do the work, the compilation work, during the periods when he was back um, in safety. And as I say, only take one notebook to the front where he could write his thoughts and go from there. Mm. Mm. I think yeah, that's interesting. And, and there's another there's another part about his biography that's probably relevant as well when we start to look at his earlier and later work. And that's that he sort of did his early work and then thought he solved everything and went and did something else for a while. And is that that? And then he sort of came back to philosophy later when he had a bit of a, a rethink. And, and hence this idea there are two philosophers: one called the early Wittgenstein and the other called the late Wittgenstein, because there was a ten year period when he, he he didn't do philosophy. That's right. He and he was a he was a primary school teacher in Lower Austria um, for six years, and then he designed this house for his sister, which took him a, a year or so. So that, there is this very clear break. And then in 1929, he came back, you know, he famously arrived back in Cambridge at the beginning of 1929 to resume philosophy. Um, now... Sorry, Michael, can you say, so what, so what age was he when he, first, because he, didn't he do something to do with, um, was it engineering or was it, there was something else first and then, and then he started philosophy. And born then, in 1889. Um, sorry? Born in 1889. Uh, famously, he was the same age as, as Hitler. And of course, they went to the same school for one year. Yeah. Although they were never in the same class because during that year, Wittgenstein was a year ahead of his age in class five. Hitler was a year behind his age in class three. <laughs> So they, they were never in the same same class, but but they were they they were they were contemporaries. Um, so um, he was brought up in uh, in Vienna, a, the youngest child of of I think, a large was it eight I think uh, of one of the wealthiest men in Austria. His father was an iron and steel magnate, um, so enormously wealthy. Um, uh, I mean, wealthy enough that, for example, there's an art gallery. In Vienna, the Secession Gallery, which was built, you know, built by Wittgenstein, by his dad. You know, he just built an art gallery. That's the kind of mm -hmm. thing he could do. Um, uh, and then he uh, was pr privately educated, apart from from when he went to this Oberrealschule in Linz um, um, when he was about fourteen. Um, then he went to train as an engineer in Berlin um, for a couple of years. Then he went to Manchester, um, where he did some experiments on um, jet engines. At that point, he got interested in philosophy of mathematics. At that point, he came to Cambridge to work with. So, so how, old is, how old is he when he then started philosophy? Um, he came to Cambridge when he was 24. No, no sorry, 22, 22 in 1911. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, Stayed in Cambridge two years to 1913, went to Norway for a year. Then, just by chance, you know, when the war broke out, he he was back in Vienna at home for the summer. Um, and then he joined up as soon as the war started. But, you know, if by chance he'd been in Cambridge when the war started, who knows how his war would have gone. Mm. He, he would have been a, a, a national of a... Of a country Britain was at war with, so I don't know what mm. that's not how the Yeah, not sure. So so he started his his early period starts when he's about twenty two yeah. to uh when he finishes the tractatus and famously thinks he sort of solved everything. How 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 long is that period? It's, it's, it took him seven years. So um if you think of nineteen eleven as when he starts work properly um in Cambridge um, and then he finishes the book in 1918. The, the, the version that was eventually published in um, well, 100 years ago um, was, was the copy that famously he had with him um, at the armistice. Um, although, again, to go back to this theme, you know, the copy that he had with him um, 
at the armistice, by which time he was on the Italian front, because of course the Eastern Front had collapsed in 1917. So by 1918, um, the Austrian army was fighting against the Italians um, in what's now Northern Italy. Right. Um, so he, he w- at the armistice, he was taken prisoner by the Italians and ended up in a prisoner of war camp at Monte Cassino. Um, uh, and although the copy that was eventually published was the one he, the typescript he had with him, that wasn't the only version. <laughs> he had a, a carbon copy of that, which he left with his sister in Vienna. Mm-hmm. To so that's the theme of he did he didn't risk having the only copy of his life's work at that point with him when he was killed in in, in war mm. he made sure it was a backup mm, that sounds sensible <laughs> so yeah. so when did he sort of come back to Cambridge and realize there was more philosophical work to do or that he didn't <laughs> didn't like actually teaching children <laughs> it's not that he didn't like it he he was um charged with assault he he has assaulted a child and left the primary school in a hurry, yeah. uh, just resigned on the spot and fled yeah. and was charged with assault. The charge was dropped, I, but I don't think it's known the details of why it was dropped. But right. Well, I have, I, have a, I have a two-year-old, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and I can understand why there might be a temptation at times, but uh, <laughs> I haven't got that far but he actually, he did actually hit the child. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Well, that doesn't happen so much when you're a philosopher at Cambridge. So, um, although although there is that poker incident that, that, that gets associated with him. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so... He was 40 in 1929 when he came back to philosophy, having, as I said, designed the house in Vienna. Um, while he was designing the house in Vienna, he started to meet various members of the Vienna Circle, um, Schlick, Weissmann, Carnap for a bit, although he fell out with Carnap. Um, so um, after a while, he insisted Carnap should not be at their meetings. He then accused Carnap of, of plagiarism. Um, so they had a very bad falling out. Um, but it's thought that these conversations that he had with members of the Vienna Circle in twenty in 28, I suppose, got his philosophical juices flowing again. Although I should say there's also a very practical reason why he came back to philosophy. Remember, at the end of the First World War, he had given away his share of the family fortune. So it left him with no no money. And then he went to earn a living as a primary school teacher. And he was adamant that he would not take handouts from his siblings who, who hadn't given away their shares of the fortune. So... He couldn't afford to go back to working in philosophy. The thing that allowed him to come back to Cambridge in 1929 and start work again on philosophy was that the deal he did with his sister was she could pay him an architect's fee for designing her house. So I'm sure part of what she was doing by letting him design her house for her was finding a way of helping him. Yeah, so yeah. The deal was he, she paid him a fee, and that fee he used to get him started in Cambridge. Eventually, in Cambridge, Trinity College gave him a research grant and then a research fellowship. But that didn't yeah. happen for, for um, another year. Yeah, well, it's very hard to get money to do philosophy, isn't it? <laughs> Always well, okay. well, then, yes. Yeah, Unless yeah, yeah. Trinity, the, you know, different right. way at Trinity. But. Yeah, so did, but did, did he give his wealth to his sister? Or am I misremembering that? Um, he gave away money to various people, um, some to, oh, there's a list of people, I can't remember. There, there was um, various artists. He, he, he compiled a list of people he wanted to help, and then he gave money away to some of them. But mm. but the, the, he did, and he did give it all away, so he really was left having to earn a living. Um, mm. That's deliberate. Um, I, I guess probably inspired by Tolstoy, you know, <laughs> this idea of, you know, w- which inspired quite a lot of people in the tw- in the twentieth century that there was something ennobling about po- poverty. Yeah, and the working classes and and getting out of intelligentsia and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's that's that's quite interesting. I, my background is actually working class. Um, not that that's what this is about. So. Yeah, 
Okay, so I think, why don't we start to look at some of his thinking? So um, quite a few people who come to this channel come because they've looked at Frege or Russell's work on philosophy of language. Um, and obviously the Tractatus speaks to that. Uh, it's sort of a different way of, of understanding the, the relationship between language and the world. Can you sort of explain a little bit about um, what Wittgenstein is doing in the Tractatus, why it's different to uh, Russell and Frege, um, and um, yeah, something along those lines. Okay, well, the first thing to say about that is that one needs to understand the Tractatus as a book composed in two phases. So this volume that I've mentioned before, the Proto-Tractatus, also referred to as Bodleianus. It was, it was given that nickname by Brian McGuinness just because it is physically in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, so he called it Bodleianus. Um, but this, this notebook in which Wittgenstein compiled the, the Tractatus allows us to follow the order in which he, the book developed. And the striking fact about it is that at the beginning of this hard, big hardback volume, he wrote down the overall framework of the book. Proposition one, you know, the world is everything that is the case. 1.1, world of totality of facts, not of things. Two, three, four. So a progression from the world to language to propositions to the structure of propositions as being what you can get from elementary propositions by applying truth functions. So you get proposition six, and then you expect there then to be proposition seven but it's not there. Proposition seven is 70 pages later in the volume. So, and until about page 60 something in this notebook, there are no propositions numbered with numbers bigger than six. So what we can say is that for a long time as he composed the book, his intention was that the last proposition of the book would tell you the general form of truth, of truth functions. And all the stuff on mysticism, all the stuff on, in the sixes, on, and all the stuff on uh, that leads up to um, Proposition 7 and throwing away the ladder, all that stuff is a later phase in the composition of the book. So one has to really talk about the two phases uh, separately. Um, so the second phase is the stuff with the mysticism and ethics, religion, things like that. The first phase is much more clearly the kind of book you would expect a student of Russell who had had various conversations with Frege and venerated Frege's writings might be expected to write. Um, so what, what does it say? Well, famously, he, he, in, the, in the preface, he acknowledges his influ the influence of the great works of Frege and the writings of my friend Bertrand Russell. Uh, what he got from Russell mainly was atomism. Um, I'm inclined to say what he got from Frege was pretty much everything else in his. Philosophy. Yeah. So, well, can you can you can you tell us what atomism is then? So, what what, what do you mean by that? Um, it's a method of analysis which he got from Russell which is the method which Russell introduced you, um, in on denoting. I know you've, you've done a, uh, uh, a YouTube thing on denoting. Well, um, Wittgenstein started with that method. So the idea of that method is that when you look at names as they occur in language, things that, gr that grammar would count as names, very often logic should not count as names it should count them as disguised descriptions. So the example, the standard example would be Homer, which is a name as far as grammar is concerned, but Homer um, is thought not to have existed. People discuss whether he existed. What do you mean if you say Homer didn't exist? Answer is you mean the Odyssey and the Iliad weren't all written by one person. They're the product of a poetic tradition. So what Russell thought that showed was that the word Homer, although grammatically a proper name, is logically a disguised, disguised definite description. So it's an abbreviation for the author of the Odyssey and the Iliad, uh, 
and that should be analysed according to Russell's theory of descriptions. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the method, and then the idea um, that Wittgenstein has is that that method um, is guaranteed to stop at a certain point, where what you get down to is things that are genuine logical names. So you analyse language, analyse and analyse. At, at a certain point, you will reach bedrock. You can't analyse any further. And at that level, language will just contain genuine logical, logical names. And then, so that's, that's what he gets from Russell. But then what he doesn't get from Russell, what he adds himself, is the picture theory. The picture theory is the idea that that language that you eventually get to when you analyze and analyze and analyze exactly matches the structure of the world. So the, what enables a proposition to say something true or false about the world, according to picture theory, is that the bits of the proposition fit together in exactly the way that the bits of the real world fit together if the proposition is true. Yeah, okay. So, um, so when it, normally, if you think about a proposition, you'd think about um, well, anyone familiar with Frege might have a bit more of a an idea that this is a thing out there, a thought of some sort, composed in a certain kind of way. Um, but if 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 what is how is Wittgenstein understanding a proposition? That's the one question. And then if there is a proposition on one hand that sort of exactly matches the real world on the other hand, what is it that makes the difference between the two? What divides the two? What makes one a proposition, the other the real world, and, and doesn't say collapse together as, say, an idealist might think it could? That is a very good and difficult question. So that question, can I answer the, the easier one first, maybe? <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Oh, and, and then one, I'll, I'll chuck one little question that you might want to answer with that. A little question? Is it as little as that one? But... No, no, well, no, no, this is, this is I think, because, again, you, once you analyze a proposition down to just its names, um, what do they name? Like, so what what is that? What kind of thing is a name as far as Wittgenstein is concerned when you get to the bedrock? And what what sort of thing does it name? Um, again, difficult question. Uh, he doesn't say he. So he has an a priori argument that, given that we do say things determinately true or false about the world, he thinks. Language must be analysable to this point where it just analyses down to names. But what their names of, he says, well, that's not for me as a philosopher to answer that. Russell, when he got the typescript of the Tractatus, um, it was it was um, delivered through the agency of Keynes, who had contacts, of course, because Keynes was involved in the in the peace negotiations. Keynes used his contacts to get. The manuscript, sorry, the typescript of the Tractatus that Wittgenstein had in Monte Cassino to get it sent by diplomatic courier in the diplomatic bag to Britain, and and it got to Russell. Russell read it, wrote a list of questions to Wittgenstein, having read it. Wittgenstein answered these questions from the prisoner of war camp. One of the questions was, well, what are the bits? You know that you you analyzed that, and he said that'd be for psychology to discover. That's not, you know, that that's not the kind of question that in my armchair as a philosopher I can answer. But he so, thought they were psychological in some sense, though. If he, if he if he's saying this is a question for psychologists to answer, does he think of them? Well, the names are. I mean, the names are for psych. I should say when he says psychology, remember this is an example where it's important to be careful about language and the way that language evolves. There are lots of words. That occur in early analytic philosophy that are modern, that are words we now use, but we now use them in slightly different senses. Yeah. So one's got to be very careful. For example, the word epistemology is used by Ramsey mm -hmm. to mean what we would call semantics. Mm -hmm. And the word psychology is used by Wittgenstein to mean what we would mean by linguistics. Okay. Right. So when he says it's for psychology to decide, I think I'd say he means it's for linguistics. It's 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 a, an analysis of actual language. You look at human language and you analyze it. 
and you find and if you analyze it those will be the simples the simple okay. yeah you get to. but so so okay so again if anyone th- anyone thinking uh it, from a background of of Frege, they're going to think well what a name is it has to be a piece of language that's a sentence or a sound or, or some symbols but obviously um, what Wittgenstein is talking about, we wouldn't know what those symbols are. It's not like it's the, it's the actual uh, typeset or symbols that we use in our language. It's, and we, we're not even conscious of what they are. So then it, it's hard to know well, what category do these names fall into. They seem to be something to do with language, but they're not uh, sentences or symbols that we're conscious of. So, yeah, they're, They are theoretical posits. They are the bits of the ideal language that that, as it were, that in principle we can think of as underpinning actual language. Um, and that's a very pro- problematic notion. Um, uh, and it's interesting to see the interaction between Wittgenstein and Russell on this point, because Russell at this point is just more practically minded. So um, I mean, another example of this would be um, one of the... One of the oddest claims in the Tractatus is that when you analyze down to these simple names and you put the simple names together to form simple propositions, you call them elementary propositions. The elementary propositions are the ones that you get before you then apply truth functions to make more complicated things. These elementary propositions, and I say we don't know exactly what they are. Um, um, they're true or false? They're all true or false, but the key point is. He thinks that the truth or falsity of any one of them has no consequences for the truth or falsity of any other of them. Hmm. They're all logically independent. Yeah. Famously, that's the first bit of brick in the wall that he pulls out in 1929. His view of the Tractatus starts to crumble in various ways in 29. That's the first thing that that does crumble. Um, So in his paper... I forgot, sorry, earlier when I was saying the only things he wrote in English, I was wrong. Of course, he wrote some remarks in logical form in English as well. Right? So that's one other thing. And it also contains arguments. Right? So, so it looks as if he, he, when he wrote in English, he, he gave arguments. When he wrote in German, he gave short sentences. Okay. Yeah. So some remarks in logical form is where he says, I was wrong to claim that the elementary propositions are independent of, of one another. Um, but now, the the fact that these he thinks these elementary propositions are independent of one another. Why does he think it? Well, he thinks it because he thinks well that just has to be the case because roughly because if it weren't the case, then the the dependencies between them would be synthetic a priori, effectively. And then he thinks. If there were synthetic a priori, a priori propositions, I'd have to write the critique of pure reason to explain how knowledge of synthetic a priori propositions is possible. And he doesn't want that. So in order not to be a transcendental idealist, he has to he just has to say elementary propositions are independent. Yeah. Has- Russell treats this as something you have to find out. Russell it wasn't in Russell's nature to think that you could just claim that elementary propositions are independent of each other just because it must be so. Russell's mm-hmm. was, well, whether elementary propositions are independent of each other, we're going to have to find out what they are and find out whether they're independent. You know, um, so and presu- for- Presumably it doesn't seem like you'd, you'd think that they would be. Um, certainly not any kind of propositions that we can think of are going to be utterly independent of anything else, um, just to, in, to do their meaning. I should actually just mention as well, um, just because some people might not know what you mean by synthetic a priori. So the idea here is that there is, um, there are things that you can know to be true that provide genuine knowledge, but without having to experience the world to tell you that it's true. This is, so, um, so maybe mathematical truths or something, you don't go out into the world and, and do tests to see whether two plus two is four. You can think about it and recognize that it is four, but that's that's a certain, there's some knowledge value in that, which is what makes it. That's right. And so people sometimes refer to a priori knowledge as armchair knowledge. So mm. it's, it's the knowledge you can get just by sitting in your armchair thinking. Um, whereas um, Kant has another 
binary distinction, which is synthetic analytic, where analytic knowledge is essentially trivial. So, you know, all bachelors are unmarried men or A equals A, that kind of thing. Synthetic is what's not, in a certain sense, trivial. So when Kant introduces the critique of pure reason, his problematic there in the book is that he sets up at the beginning is he claims there is synthetic Ipora knowledge. He think, he claims that mathematics gives examples of it. So geometry, he thinks, contains synthetic Ipora knowledge. He thinks ethical knowledge can be synthetic Ipora knowledge. Scientific knowledge, you know, scientific laws can be um, synthetic Ipora. And so he has this series of, and, and philosophical knowledge can be synthetic Ipora. So he has a series of cases where he thinks there's synthetic Ipora knowledge. And then his task in the critique is to show how that's possible. So that's the whole book is structured as an explanation of how there can be synthetic Ipora knowledge. Yeah. Um, so Wittgenstein then has this these sort of elementary propositions that are all independent of each other. A little bit like you might think of particles. Or obviously, they're not physical. They're, they're, they're propositions. Um, and these can be completely recombined in any kind of way. And any sort of combination of truths and false will be a certain way the world might be. Uh, yes, let's, truth let's possibility. You call them truth possibilities. You, right. To call them possible worlds, that's fine, as long as you don't reify them. He's not a David Lewis figure who thinks mm -hmm. all these possibilities are all really out there. They're mm -hmm. just possibilities. Um, so the world is everything that is the case, not everything that might be the case. So there's one world which, um, which has which exemplifies one distribution of T, T's and F's across elementary propositions. Mm. So it's every other way of distributing T's and F's across elementary propositions is a genuine possibility. Yeah. And so so there's two, so two things where that touches on something, things that uh, people listening to this may know or be interested in. So one is that uh, you briefly mentioned it, that so Wittgenstein's idea of, of the nature of the world is the sum total of what is the case or these are facts. But that's not what his propositions are. His propositions are the things that picture facts, right? Whereas if you if you if you take things from a Frigian point of view, his thoughts are the facts. So the thoughts that are the, the senses of sentences are are the true ones anyway. Well, yeah, true. Yeah, a fact is a thought that is true, is what he says. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So there's so there's that so there's that difference. Whereas Wittgenstein has a separation then between our propositions or the semantic content. Uh, what do you think of the sense and, and then and then the world? And then the other thing is that that means that he has, because he has this sort of idea of independent propositions, propositions that are clearly not independent, say logic, um, that logically follow from each other or, or tautologies um, and contradictions, he, ha he has a different way of understanding them in terms of, of meaning as well, doesn't he? Yes. So, so part of what distinguishes him from Frege is... That he's not that he's an atomist and Frege isn't. So if you ask, how do you map Wittgenstein's um, account onto Frege's? There are parts of it that map on really quite closely, and other parts that just don't at all. So the part that doesn't at all is that Wittgenstein thinks that you can analyze down and then at a certain point just stop. And Frege just doesn't. Frege has no conception of that Frege uh, never seems to have even addressed properly um, the argument in non-denoting. I mean, uh, it's an example of two philosophers talking past each other. Um, there's famously a, a friend of Wittgenstein's in, um, that he met in Cambridge called Jourdain, who was also a friend of Russell's, wrote to Frege. Jourdain was keen to um, bring Frege's works to it. To, to British and, well, to English-speaking attention. And, and Jourdain was interested in trying to publish some translations of, of, of Frege. Um, he wrote to Frege, and one of the questions he asked him was, do you accept, Frege, that Russell has shown that you don't need the sense reference distinction? And Frege, Frege of course, replied with this famous letter um, about Arteb and Afla, two, two ways of looking at the same mountain, Frege thought this was an argument that showed that you couldn't get a, an exact matchup between language and the world because there's one mountain out there, but you look at it from one valley and you call it Afla. You look at it from another valley and you call it Arteb. 
And you don't yet realise that Afla and Arteb are actually the same mountain. So it's basically, it's the Hesperus Phosphorus mm. point, but just made with an example using a mountain rather than a planet. Um, so Frege thought that argument showed that you just needed the notion, his notion of sense as being different ways of looking at the world, different aspects that the world can have. Whereas Wittgenstein's conception is that he would side with Russell and should say, well, all that shows is that the words Afla and Arta are just disguised descriptions. Mm -hmm. Afla is just an abbreviation for the mountain you see if you look from over there, and Arteb is an abbreviation for the mountain you see if you look from over here, you know. Um, Two descriptions of the same thing. Yeah. Um, so it just shows you haven't analysed far mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. When you do analyse down to the bedrock, you get to names of what he calls objects. Now you asked, what are they? Well, um, you're talking about Wittgenstein here now, not Russell. Yeah. 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 Wittgenstein uses the word object as a technical term in the Tractatus for whatever it is that a name refers to. And the reason we can say it's a technical term is that precisely mountains, for example, can't be Tractarian objects precisely because they can have different aspects. So a Tractarian object has to be an entity which has a certain kind of simplicity such that it cannot have different aspects. You cannot have two different names pointing at the same object and not realise that the, the names of this mm. are the same. So, so for Wittgenstein, uh, Frege's example is just a one-line proof that mountains aren't objects. So if you get if you get down into Wittgenstein's, if if we could, per and possible, sort of have have a sentence which had been completely analysed to its 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 atomic names, and so then at that level, there's no predicates or or we just have a string of names, right? Yeah. Um, in a chain, is that is that was that, that his phrase yes, hanging yeah, together yeah. in a chain? Yeah. Like um, chain, yes. Yeah. So so if, if we if we had a sentence like that and we were able to understand it, then there could be no uh, error because those names are sort of exactly or precisely connect. So then that brings us back to the question that, that you said was a difficult question that we touched on before. If you then have this completely analyzed proposition where these names are simple and there's no, you know, the sense reference distinction is collapsed, uh, then in what sense is the proposition not the world itself or not? Uh, how do you maintain this distinction between proposition and fact? Um, does he think about that or not? Yes, I don't know if he has a terribly good answer, but I mean, you maintain the distinction just because you need that distinction in order to distinguish between a proposition and its truth or falsity. So he, he just takes it as a given throughout the Tractatus that there's two stages. One is you represent the world truly or falsely. Stage two is you look at the world to find out whether what you said is true or false. Right? So you have to then have a distinction between propositions and facts in order that some propositions will be true because there are facts that match up with them and some propositions will be false because there are no facts that match up with them. So truth and falsity then is, is really about existence. Would, you, would that be the case? So, yeah. An elementary proposition is true just in case the atomic fact to use the Ogden Ramsey translation, or State of Affairs, to use the Pierce McGuinness translation, uh, that corresponds to it, exists. Or he uses, mm. bestehen is the verb he uses. It can be translated exists or obtains. Um, by the way, I should say, by the way, that there are about to be two more translations of the Tractatus that are going to appear, which are going to use different English for these all these basic German terms. So, right. Two, that we're going to now have more to cope with um, if you talk in English about these. So yeah. the German word here is Zachbehalt. So, um. Well, so but in, in some ways, then, it's almost like you've got a different kind of sense reference distinction introduced because obviously with Frege, your thoughts are your facts, uh, the true ones. And then you have this realm of reference. Yeah. Um, Wittgenstein, you have the proposition and then you have the world itself, which may or may not have a fact. But the, the difference would be is that obviously Frege just says the true. I mean, in some, the object that 
that true thoughts refer to uh, isn't doesn't distinguish between uh, different kinds of facts. The thoughts are the, are the things that are distinguished from each other. Yes. Uh, so, in some way, it, 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 do you think that there is? How would you sort of resolve this uh, issue, or, or do you think it's um, just a case of where they shift their ideas of the nature of the world or ontology or, or do you think there's something of substance in this debate yes i do i think that um i think that Frege shows some influences from the absolute idealist tradition so you can you could think of the true as being a kind of you know, an absolute entity. Um, Wittgenstein doesn't have that, but you could certainly um, see the Tractatus as having another kind of idealism um, because Proposition 1 of the Tractatus seems to me to embody a certain kind of ide idealist notion, or at least we, a, a weak, I would call it a weak idealism, because proposition say, one says the world is everything that is the case. Mm. Now, what is the case is what it is, it is possible to represent as being so in language. So what is the case isn't trees and mountains and planets. What is the case is facts about tree, trees and mountains and planets. So the whole Tractatus is predicated on an overarching assumption, which is that the world it cons is a representable world. The mm. world consists of facts. Facts have the right shape to be represented. The picture theory then tells you that facts have the same structure as the propositions that are, are true if those facts occur and false if they don't. But why think that the facts which correspond, that match up so closely with the propositions are all there is that's out there? What does, what's the argument in the Tractatus that there isn't another aspect to, to, to the world consisting of stuff that isn't fact-like. Maybe the things that compose facts. The answer is there is no argument in the Tractatus. It's just built into Proposition 1. You're just told. And it's interesting that, you know, famously when Frege was sent a typescript of the Tractatus to look at, he replied with a series of questions which showed that he probably hadn't made it through past page one, um, and which showed that he was completely uncomprehending of it. And it, it really de devastated Wittgenstein. He was enormously disappointed because Frege was his philosophical hero, and Frege's reaction to the book was so negative. Um, I mean, partly just practical advice, like one tries to give <laughs> graduate students practical advice, Partly, Frege was tr trying to be helpful. Frege said to him, um, first, you should try to give arguments for your conclusions. Second, you should try splitting the book up into short sections. Maybe you can get one of them published in one journal and another published in a different journal. You can see this is the kind of advice I would talk to you about in another, in another <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah. Um, he was oh, yeah. But you know, he, he didn't see, Frege didn't see the Tractatus as a work of, you know, uh, the a unified work of genius. He saw it as a, a bewildering book. And yeah. he, he, asked, he asked about Proposition 1. He said, well, is that supposed to be a definition or a theorem? Hmm. Are you saying what I mean by the world is just the world is to be defined as everything is the case? Or are you making a claim in Proposition 1 about a, the world as antecedently understood? And that's actually a good question. <laughs> mm. Is Proposition 1 supposed to be a definition or a theorem? You could take it as either. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could speculate about that, I suppose, if you, if you start off by saying the world is, is, is the 
the, the sum total of what is the case, then you may overcome some of the epistemic problems you'd get about how we know about the world, because especially if you have an idea of facts uh, as somehow constructed according to our ways of conceiving the world, there's some, something conceptual going on there. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, if we start talking about Russell, obviously, <laughs> they all have to deal with this problem in, in different ways as to what they think of the things that, that are known out there. But but it is it is interesting when you're looking at the different approaches together, and especially as we'll continue to do in comparison with some of the the, the British idealism at the time. It's um, it sometimes it can seem as though they're poles apart, and then the more you look at them, you start to recognise a lot of overlap and connection. That they're all dealing, they have to deal with the same problems. At some point, they might start from a different position where the, their intuitions are, are the strongest, and then yeah. We're always going to have this mind world gap um, that that has to be overcome in some ways, and whether we're talking about language or logic or or, or anything, isn't there? Um, yes, that's a good way of putting it. And I think I would say that Wittgenstein's way of bridging the mind world gap is really to pretend it isn't there. It's the picture theory is supposed to make the gap between mind and world so small that. It, there's nothing there to bridge, really. So the the risks of transcendental idealism are just dissipated by by legislating that there are no things in themselves. You know, mm. it's, it, you could. So that's why you can read the whole book as as basically idealist. You can say that objects in the tractatus are just posits to be whatever names refer to. Um, thought of that way, the book looks idealist. Or you can re reverse the picture and present it as a realist book where there is a world out there that language then has, our language has to fit onto. But my, my own view is that both those ways of presenting it are misleading. The, the world first view or the language first view, I think are both not what the book does. I think what the book does is try to be neutral between them. So the book is an account of the relationship between language and world. One, that, uh, it, I don't think it prioritizes language or that it prioritizes world. It, it mm. takes both together and talks about the relationship between them. Very interesting. Okay, right. I'm aware that we've, we've been we've been talking for quite a while, which is really great. And I, I do want to get to some philosophical investigations, but just before we move on from Tractatus, uh, because I know um, it's it's the book that you've you've written the most about. Um, as well, because um, we haven't said too much about what you'd mentioned with with the sort of propositions six and seven, where it gets a bit mi mystical. Could you say a little bit about, say, the showtail distinction and where he lands at the very end of Tractatus uh, so, as a way of, sort of finishing our chat on this section? Yeah. So the the showing telling showing saying distinction is the idea that. Um, Sorry, show and tell is, is I've got kids. It's the yes, school thing, isn't it? Monday morning, show and tell, bring something for her. <laughs> show saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the idea comes in two stages. The first stage is, is the banal thought that for every language, there are going to be some things that language can't say because it doesn't have the right words for them. Um, so, for example... Uh, and there's a an old Cambridge tradition which you, you may have been to, which is that annually there's a ceremony in the Senate House where they give away honorary degrees, um, and the university orator has to make a speech about each honorary graduand um, to say why they're worthy of the distinction or honorary degree from Cambridge. And of course, I mean, those happen at other universities too. The, the, the distinctive twist at Cambridge, of course, is that speech is in, is in Latin. Um, and so the, the joke nowadays is that the university orator has to make a speech to explain in Latin why Bill Gates has been given an honorary, an honorary degree by Cambridge. So he has to say in Latin what's distinctive about the Microsoft Windows operation system. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that you can see the problem. Yeah. Um, now the point is that the fact that classical Latin has no word for <laughs> the Windows operating system 
doesn't show anything deep about the inexpressibility of operating systems, right? It just shows that Latin didn't have a word for it because it didn't have the need for one. Hmm. But now, um, if you take any language and you try to explain what it is that enables that language to be expressive, Wittgenstein's idea is you can't do that in the language itself. Because you'd be presupposing what it is you're trying to explain. Right? So, for example, if you want to explain how does how is it why is it that spatial language succeeds spatial vocabulary, the, the language of geometry, that it succeeds in being expressive of the structure of space. You can't do that just in that language because the language presupposes what you're trying to explain. Mm. Okay, so that's the first stage of Wittgenstein's argument. But that is only a relative inexpressibility claim. The fact that spatial language can't be used to explain the features of, that make it expressive doesn't show that those features are ultimately inexpressible. Because you, there might be another language you can fall back on that, that you can use to express it. Okay? But now, here's the second stage, and the second stage is the kicker. It's that Wittgenstein thinks that the structure of the language, the language, the ultimate language, you know, which you get to when you analyze and analyze and analyze, that has what he calls logical form. So spatial vocabulary is the, the, the vocabulary of a language that has spatial form, there may be other forms of language, but then there's this distinctive form he calls logical form, which is the ultimate structure of language. And he thinks that that form is the most general form that a language can, can have. So there cannot be any retreat from it to a more expressive language. There cannot be any re retreat from logical form because it is just the most general form that language has to have in order to be language at all. So that's wh where you get the same showing distinction. So this is now an absolute inexpressibility claim. The claim is that if you try to explain what it is about logical form that makes it a form that enables us to talk, to represent truly or falsely things about the world, then there is no language in which you can explain that. So all you can do is exhibit a show that this language is expressible by using it to express things. We use language to say things about the world. We succeed in using it to say things about the world. The fact that we succeed shows that, shows the features of logical form, but those features are, according to this claim, ultimately inexpressible. Mm, mm. So you can see how the, fam the famous saying showing distinction, which structures the whole approach in the book, is a consequence of a claim, namely the claim that logical form is the most general form that, that language can have. And then you ask, well, what's the argument, argument in the tractatus for that claim on which the saying showing distinction depends? And the answer is, there isn't one. The book doesn't give an argument. It, it claims that there is logical form, but it doesn't give an argument why there is logical form. No, it just has an argument then to, to say why an argument is in principle impossible. Is that, am I, is that right? If I'm, am I following what you said? So it, yeah. it's not something you can argue. I can't express an argument for it. I just, I just have to show you by, by using language. Or... Well, my view is that actually, if you try to construct for Wittgenstein the argument that he forgot to supply in the book, I think you'll find that the argument you end up with is pretty close to the weak idealist assumption that I'm that I suggested was embedded in Proposition One. I think they're part of the same circle of ideas. So I think it's part of the same desire not to fall into transcendental idealism. Right? So the same desire that. Um, 
want him to outlaw the notion of things in themselves as um, things beyond the reach of, of representational language. I think the idea is that the claim that logical form is the most general form that can be is also part of the desire to uh, block the route to Kant, the route to particular theories. I think they're all part of the same the same mm. game. Okay, Michael, thanks very much. That's that's really good. Um, so maybe as a way of uh, wrapping up things with the Tractatus, can you say a little bit more about Proposition 7, where he discusses some of his ideas in terms of ethics and religion, and, and then we'll go on to philosophical investigations? Well, it's, it's the lead up to Proposition 7. It's, it's the sixes, really. I mean, 7 is how the right. book ends, um, you know, the injunction to silence. Um, but in the sixes... I mean, one way of thinking of the sixes is actually um, as a kind of commentary on the critique of pure reason. Remember I said earlier that in the critique, Kant's problematic is um, there are these areas, mathematics, science, um, ethics, philosophy, um, where Kant thinks there is synthetic a priori knowledge, and then the problem is how is that possible? answer transcendental idealism. Well, if you look at the sixes of the Tractatus, what are they about? Well, the 6.1s are on logic, the 6.2s are on mathematics, the 6.3s are on science, the 6.4s are on ethics, and the 6.5s are on philosophy. So they're covering precisely the areas that Kant had identified as synthetic a priori. And so what the sixes do I remember I said the sixes are the bit that in his original plan for the book weren't going to be there at all. The book was going to end at Proposition 6. So the sixes are things that come after that were all added in a later um, set of revisions to the book, which he did from kind of autumn 1916 onwards. Um, uh, what he does with these revisions is he addresses this problem and in each case, his answer is going to be that this, that putative synthetic a priori knowledge, stuff that looks like synthetic a priori knowledge, will actually turn out to be stuff you can only show but not say. So the, his answer eventually is going to be there are no synthetic a priori propositions, i.e. things that you can, you can say in, in language, but there can be things which you can in some way gesture towards which play the role that Kant had thought so that a priori knowledge plays. Mm. Now, as soon as I've said that, of course, there will be some commentators, some modern commentators on the tractators who will be screaming at their screens because I talked about gesturing towards what can be only shown but not said. Um, one of the big areas which has reinvigorated tractator scholarship in the last, I suppose, 30 years has been the so-called resolute reading of the book. The resolute reading is the idea that we should take very seriously the notion that these things which you can only show but not say are oh, nonsense. Um, um, you should treat them as literally nonsense. And then at the end of the book, famously in 6.54, he talks about throwing away the ladder after you've climbed up it. So you throw the book away, um, and then you, after you've thrown it away, you're enjoined to silence. The oddity of the book, which is an oddity for all, for everyone, whether they're a resolute reader or not, is that most of the propositions in the book are, by the book's own lights, nonsense, right? They are things that you can't say, because the things you can say in language are the ordinary things, the things that could be false, the things that happen to be true but could be false. So you can say there's a book on the table, that's straightforwardly true or false. But all these insights that the Tractatus is trying to put across 
or is apparently trying to put across, by the end of the book, you come to realize are things you can't say in language, but can only show. And so everyone reading the book has to have a moment at the end when they think, what was that about? How did that happen? How did it happen that I read a book, I started reading a book that I thought was making claims, accessible as true or false. By the end of the book, I come to realize that the book has undermined itself. And I come to realize that the things I thought were tr claims true or false are things that can't be said. Now, everyone reading the book has to recognize that problem. The debate over the resolute reading is how should one understand that? So is the idea supposed to be that when you put the book away, having read it, you are left with an ineffable understanding of the relationship between language and world, uh, an understanding you can't put into words, but nonetheless an, uh, something we could call an understanding, that's the irresolute view. Or the resolute view is it that you're left with nothing. In other words, on the resolute account, the aim of the book, by the time he, he finished it, not, I think, the aim of the book when he started planning it, um, but the aim of the book by the time he added the sixes and Proposition 7, the aim of the book on the resolute view is to show that the project which grounded the birth of analytic philosophy, the project which Frege and Russell were engaged in, collapses under its own weight into nothing. So on the resolute interpretation, um, Wittgenstein was trying to show that, trying to demonstrate that if you try to give an account of logic, which is what Frege and then Russell were trying to do, an account of how it is that logic succeeds in being the, the vehicle it is for, for understanding the structure of um, truth accessible claims about the world. If you try to do that project and you try as best, try to do it the best way you can, that's what the first part of the tractatus is trying to do, you will end up with the conclusion that the project is simply a, a cul-de-sac, that there is no um, um, understanding that can be had of that relationship between yeah. the, 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 the tries to understand the structure of truth. Right. So well, a couple of things on that then. Um, I mean, in some ways, uh, so I haven't come across those two readings, but I can see how they, they would be there. So um, if we're taking the analogy of climbing up a ladder and then knocking it away seriously, it certainly seems as though you're somewhere different to where you started. You're now wherever it was that the ladder took you, and now you don't need the ladder, so you get rid of the ladder. That would sort of suggest more of what you're calling the non-resolute reading, that you're left, you, you don't, you, you're not quite sure how the ladder managed to get you there or how you got where you are because you recognize that there was something kind of, uh, not how it appeared in, in the way in which you got there, but you are still somewhere different. The other thing to th is that, uh, so that's one thought I had. And another thought I had was that, it, could it be that in some ways, the, on whichever reading it is, that it's almost like a proof by contradiction. If this is possible, this is where you end up with its own impossibility. But if you if you demonstrate, if, if you have a kind of a, a, a contra an argument that leads to contradiction, um, you're not left with nothing necessarily, are you? Because you're, you're at least left with the fact that this is this is a an endeavor that that cannot succeed. Um, and, and partly, I'm saying that is, and I know you've looked a bit at uh, uh, Bradley and, and, and people as well. Is that when I've come across these ideas, and they they emerge in different places, I think that something similar happens with Frege when he's discussing truth. Uh, you you. One way you could do the, the, the sort of the Bradleyan way, I think, would be to say that you have gained something. You just haven't. You can recognise that even where you are, there are still contradictions inherent. But that's okay because everything is contradictory. But you've got closer to truth, or you've you, you've started to get somewhere in that process. So there are all these sort of different ideas floating around there. Um, I mean, do you have an opinion on it? Or yes, um, the first thing I'd say is it's it's interesting you talked about. The, the the metaphor of, of climbing the ladder and, and reaching somewhere higher up than you were 
before. Um, in fact, there is a debate, a sub-debate of this resolutely resolute debate, precisely about the translation of the German word Überwinden, which is the, ver the verb he uses in 6.54, and whether that should be translated as transcend or um, surmount, should should, should the, 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 the English word we use to convey it give you an idea of going up and to, to somewhere, or is it just um, getting past, as it were, putting behind you? Um, so, I mean, my view about that is, I, I, I don't think there's that much you can do with the exact wording of the metaphor. You know, I think it's, I don't think he, in, I don't know whether he intended it that precisely. Um, uh, but the other, the, the other point I was going to make is, you talked about a, a proof by reductio ad absurdum, a proof by contradiction. Well, but this isn't that, is it? Because a proof by contradiction is where you assume P, you derive contradiction, Q and not Q, therefore you conclude not P. Hmm. That's proof by contradiction. Reductio ad absurdum, absurd, as it's called. But this is reduction not to absurdity, i.e. proving something in its negation, which is absurdity. It's proof by nonsensicality. Hmm. Assume P, conclude a piece of gibberish, therefore conclude that P itself was gibberish because it led to gibberish. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's so right. Yeah, that's in some ways, it's, it's the methodology that's on the stand, isn't it? As well, it's the idea that we can give this account of logic and, and and meaning and how it connects to the world, and you end up with showing that that you couldn't possibly say it, uh, so you couldn't capture it in in a theory. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so then the question is, once you've done that, and you realise you can't express it, do you nonetheless get left with? An inexpressible understanding, yeah. would get left with nothing. Yeah, well, I think I think that we, we, so. Um, Frege has a similar problem, doesn't he? When he's trying to uh, elucidate things, his, the, the primitive symbols of his notation, and so he he talks in places about uh, words similar to gesturing, like "oh, we need a meeting of minds," and "and I need yes. a pinch of salt," and so he's exactly he, that. Yes, he's making similar kind of moves. It's like, well. I can't say exactly it because I because because I'm trying to define things or start off with these primitive notions. But I ha I'm going to sort of give you hints and and, and gesture towards. Um, so I think there's something quite intuitive about that. And you'd mentioned how Wittgenstein had a lot to do with Frege, so there there could be an argument there to say that you know, he might have got that from uh, that idea from Frege. In which case, maybe he does have this idea of, of needing to just show or gesture or just talk around and there's a wonderful paper by peter geach called saying and showing in in frege and wittgenstein which mm. argues ex basically exactly that which tries to make the parallel between frege on the concept horse and wittgenstein on the saying showing distinction so i mean the, the phrase you use the, the, about the pinch of salt is the phrase that frege uses um about precisely the concept horse paradox. Mm. I don't know if your your viewers if you have got another YouTube video that explains that. If you don't, you should. No, yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want me to give a, a, a thirty second explanation of the concept horse paradox? Well, well, we'll save that for when we talk about Frege. So, um, because I th yeah, I think there's lots of ways we can go with this. We'll, we'll try and stick to Wittgenstein and, and where that connects his stuff directly connects him. Okay. So I'll just quickly say that the, that Frege held that his own semantic, his own theory of semantics led to the curious consequence that something that seems to be true, namely that the concept horse is a concept, turns out um, to miss its target. At that point, Frege invokes the pinch of salt that he hopes his reader will um, grant him to grasp his meaning. And it's many commentators have thought that Wittgenstein um, was essentially just not granting the pinch of salt. So Wittgenstein, starting from that point of Frege, and saying, well, suppose you don't grant the pinch of salt. What then? Well, you have to recognise that this thing that Frege was attempting 
to gesture at all, just is unsayable. Mm. Well, since, I, since I've got you on here, I think, can we try a little bit of speculation on this that connects to something else you said before? Because if Wittgenstein's idea of, of, of meaning is that you can analyze a sentence, so we talked about the difference between Frege and Wittgenstein's idea about meaning, and that Frege is that, well, you can just keep analyzing things. It's not this bedrock kind of way in which there's some objective set of names going on here in the sentence. Whereas for Wittgenstein, you do have that. So I wonder if Wittgenstein doesn't have the same wiggle room to talk about ideas of gesturing uh, or pinch of salt in language. And, and could he then mean showing in, in a less linguistic sense um, or more transcendent sense? Because Frege doesn't have the more kind of appeals to transcendent or something else uh, going on as well. Yeah. I think one of the big difficulties with the Tractatus is the gap there seems to be between ordinary language and the precise language, the progression, you might call it, that's Frege's word, but Frege's word, which means concept script, the, the precise language. Frege had hoped to design a precise language for expressing mathematics or sciences. Um, what's the relationship between that precise language and the ordinary language we actually speak? Um, now, famously, Russell, in his introduction to the Tractatus, which he wrote basically just to help, because the idea was Wittgenstein would find it easier to get a publisher for the book if someone famous like Russell wrote an introduction to it. So Russell would read to write an introduction. Russell says in the introduction that this is a book about the, the necessary features that a logically perfect language will have to have. Right? And Ramsey, um, who um, was responsible for drafting the first English translation when it was published in the dual language edition in 1922, Ramsey um, then wrote a critical notice on the book, which is basically the first piece of serious philosophy reacting to the Tractatus that was published. Um, and, I mean, remarkably, he wrote this critical notice in the summer of 1923, um, when he was 20, when he'd just graduated from Cambridge, not in philosophy, but in mathematics. So philosophy was just a spare time activity for him. So that summer, he wrote this critical notice. He hadn't even met Wittgenstein at that point. After he'd written it, he then went to Lower Austria, to Puchberg, um, which was where Wittgenstein was then a primary school teacher. Um, if you've never been to Puchberg, it's a lovely place. It's um, the nearest British equivalent would be kind of like Harrogate. You know, it's a, it's a, a kind of spa town kind of place, which. Right people from Vienna would go out on the train. There's, there's a branch line railway. So you can go out from Vienna for a day trip. And the, the, the highest mountain in Lower Austria is just next to Puchberg. And there's a, so there's a, there's a rack railway up, up the mountain. So people would go out from Vienna for the day, get the rack railway up, have a coffee and cake in the tea shop at the top of the Rack Railway, look at the view, and then come back down and go back to Vienna. That's a, that was a day trip, right? It's Puchberg, that's, that's Puchberg, where Wittgenstein was at that point, a, a teacher. And Ramsey went to, to, to visit him, and they went through the book in detail, you know, and talked about lots of it. My point is just the critical notice was written before that, so it's just Ramsey responding to the book. He didn't have Wittgenstein then to help him interpret it. But the critical analysis is one of the best pieces of, one of the best discussions of the, um, the of the Tractatus that there is. So mm. it really is an astonishing piece of work. Um, and now I can't remember why I mentioned, what was I talking about before? You, I got derailed um, onto book oh, we, we were speculating, uh, I th we were speculating a little bit on whether or not the gesturing thing, uh, Wittgenstein wouldn't have the room to make it a linguistic uh, parts because of the way he understood language compared to uh, uh, but also had this additional kind of openness to a transcendent uh, notion oh, okay. I remember, so I remember you, know, you, can, you can cut out this bit in the edit Yeah, I remember why I was talking about 
Ramsey. So Russell, I was, what I was saying was Russell in the introduction says that um, we're aiming, that, that the book is about the features a logically perfect language has to have. Mm. Ramsey in his critical notice says, we might suspect that on some point Russell has got the book wrong. And he identifies this as a point in which he thinks Russell may be wrong. And the point of disagreement is that Wittgenstein says in the book that ordinary language, just as it is, is logically in perfect order. It's a very curious remark for him to make, but he, he makes it. Mm. Well, so, especially curious if he'd had connections with Frege, because that's such a... Yeah. So I think the difference between Wittgenstein in the Tractatus and Russell at this period of his life where he writes the introduction is that Russell has been convinced by his pre-war interactions with Wittgenstein that the project of an analysis that leads you to atomism is going to lead you not just to atomism, but to solipsism. Because on Russell's conception, if you analyze and analyze and analyze, what are the symbols, what are the simple bits of language going to name? Well, Russell thinks they're going to name the things that are indubitable in experience, the things you can't be mistaken about. Yeah, I'm just going to pause you a quick bit, Michael. So solipsism is the idea that the world you inhabit, you're the only one sort of inhabiting that world, that there are no other minds other than your own. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, there are various versions of it. Um, it. It's usually used in philosophy as a foil in the sense that the idea is supposed to be, well, of course, solipsism is crazy. Yeah. So solipsism is a position we're interested in just to understand how we can avoid it. Right. That most philosophers who talk about it at all just talk about it as something daft that we need to avoid. It's, it's, I mean, it's a version of, <coughs> of, of the kind of metaphysical nihilism, which mm. is also used as a foil. Um, you know, it's one of these oddities that people who aren't philosophers imagine that a lot of philosophy is about how you know that there's an external world. And of course, as you know, very little of philosophy is actually discussing how you know that there's an external world. Yeah. And to the extent that we do discuss in, as philosophers whether there's an external world, it's not that we seriously doubt it. It's that we want to understand what it is that underpins the knowledge we plainly do have. About mm. it. Yeah, and our conceptions of what it consists of. and um, Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and I know that, 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 that whenever you bring up idealism for example there is an idea that it is means there is no external world and and obviously that's not the case for most idealisms as well so yeah 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 so solipsism is is a version of idealism it's kind of extreme version of idealism so mm -hmm. i idealism is the view that somehow the world is dependent on minds exactly how that dependency is supposed to work differs with different idealists um Solipsism is the view that the world is dependent on just one world, one mind, namely mine. Mm, mm, mm. And there is an, there are parts of Wittgenstein's tractatus that are interpreted as an argument for solipsism as well, aren't there? Yes. And, I mean, I, I've written about the connection between Wittgenstein's version of solipsism in the tractatus and the, ver and the version that I think he was pressing on Russell in Cambridge before the war. And I think what happened was he persuaded Russell that if you have this project, this atomistic project, and you think that your language can be broken down into simple bits that refer to things that are indubitable in experience, that is going to lead you to solipsism. Why? Well, because my language can be analysed down into bits so that the simple name, the genuinely simple names that aren't just disguised descriptions, but genuinely simple, are names of things that are indubitable in my experience. So I can point at the the green wall that people can see, probably see behind me. Um, everyone <laughs> comments on how green my walls are. Um, I didn't paint them; they were, they were like this when I 
moved in. But anyway, I can point over there at that patch of green in my visual field, and I can name it. I can't name the wall because it's at least, you know, in some loose sense, conceive, you know, I can sort of conceive of the possibility that the wall is actually an optical illusion or a hologram or something. But when I look over there, the patch of green in my visual field, I can't be mistaken about that. Hmm. So I can name that patch in my visual field, call it A, right? If I do call it A, then A there is a genuine name. Yeah. Okay, but now, what about your language? You're what, what, seeing this on your screen. You see a patch of green in your visual field. It's not the same patch of visual of green that I, I see in my visual field. So you can give the patch in your visual field a name, call it B. So my language breaks down to names of things that are indubitable in my experience. Your language breaks down into names of things that are indubitable in your experience. So how do you understand what I'm talking about? Because mm -hmm. you don't have my language. But all the bits of my language that, that purport to talk about the world um, are names of bits of my experience that you've never had. Mm. So, so that's that if you have a language where then everything just ultimately refers to uh, parts of your own experience, then it's almost as though the meaning of the words that I speak uh, has no kind of public content to it that you and I necessarily share. Yep. So therefore, my language can only ever describe and draw on my own personal experience. So it can never reach beyond my own experience, which is a kind of solipsism, or at least the world that yep. I can... Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly it. That is, that is the argument. And there's a set of lectures that Russell gave in 1918, um, just before he was sent to prison for six months for um, uh, libeling Her Majesty's his majesty's allies um the lectures on logical atomism um these lectures are very interesting just because an accident of their timing because from 1914 to 1918 russell had lost interest in philosophy he devoted himself during the war to campaigning um to political campaigning 1918 he gives these lectures this is really his comeback to philosophy. But at that point, he had, he, it was just before he received the Tractatus, which we talked about earlier, getting the typescript sent from Italy. So when he gave those lectures, he hadn't seen the Tractatus. And indeed, there's a footnote where he says, you know, some of these ideas are, to due, are due to Mr. Wittgenstein, my former student, I, but I don't know whether he's alive or dead. So... Russell hoped to use these lectures partly to put forward the ideas of Wittgenstein that for all he knew who for all he knew was now dead mm. the ideas that Wittgenstein had had before the war uh, and which he put into the notes on on logic which which Russell had had read mm. so the, 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 the one the, these lectures are a wonderful kind of snapshot of Russell reacting to pre-war Wittgenstein not yet having read the Tractatus. So it's mm. very soon after that, he did read the Tractatus. So after that, everything he says about Wittgenstein will be informed by that. But in these lectures, we get to see Russell's understanding of the pre-war Wittgenstein. And in these lectures, Russell offers exact, basically the argument we've just been discussing and Russell, Russell's solution to it is, so that shows, isn't it lucky, he says, that we don't speak a logically perfect language? Because if, if I did speak a logically perfect language that could be analysed down into names of my own sense data, you wouldn't be able to understand me. So luckily, ordinary language has a kind of, there's a kind of play in the bearings between ordinary language and logically perfect language. So ordinary language is, he thinks, is kind of vague and approximate. This ideal language isn't the language we actually speak, and it's this kind of vagueness that gives you the, the 
room for manoeuvre that allows you to understand me. Gosh, that seems very. I mean, there, there seems so many holes in in that kind of argument to me. But let's not let's not let's not go there. But, but then, so going back to Wittgenstein, when Wittgenstein yeah. says in the Tractatus that ordinary language, just as it is, is in logically perfect working order, Wittgenstein is blocking off that mm. of Russell's. So I think that's why Russell, when he writes the introduction to the Tractatus still sees Wittgenstein through this lens of thinking that um, ordinary language is one thing, logically perfect language is another. The Tractatus is about the logically perfect language. What Wittgenstein wants to say in the Tractatus is, no, the, sure, the book is about logically perfect language, but that, in a sense, is what ordinary language comes down to. So Wittgenstein is denying the, the kind of split that Russell thinks he can make between the ordinary language and the logically perfect language. But natural language is logically perfect only once it's been fully analysed to its atomic yeah. names, etc. Yeah. So not... not, not... Do that. So no. it, it yeah. is a curious kind of thing. That, that the is, idea is, it... of is that this is, in a sense, an idealisation in that we can't actually analyse language. But Wittgenstein thinks... It's not an idealization in the sense of being something that doesn't genuinely underlie our language. Well, I mean that that's that's not too. Um, I mean, it's odd to apply that to language, but I mean that's that's sort of the uh, realist or naive understanding we get of what physicists do. I mean, you you can't directly observe fundamental particles, but it's it's a it's if you if that is how it is, then that explains other things, and it has to be like this to account for things like that yeah yes. okay um i think i think we probably need to go on to philosophical investigation so yep. um i don't um you can comment on this but as i said to you in an email i, I had been told by someone who attended your lectures that you said that uh, everything good wittgenstein had to say he said in the tractatus and i know you've written a lot more on the tractatus um than you have on um, philosophical investigations um but probably when people think about Wittgenstein, the stuff they learn is philosophical investigations. And I'd mentioned to you um, that as an undergraduate, there was a paper on Wittgenstein. It was the only paper that was purely about a particular thinker. And that was entirely on philosophical investigations. I only came across Tractatus when I got to Cambridge. Um, so can you say a little bit about why they are different? Some of the ways in which they, they still have Wittgenstein's Vic, thumbprint on them um, and um, why or if you think one higher than the other okay well the first thing I'd say is I'm disappointed to hear that the Wittgenstein paper you did as an undergraduate didn't have tractatus in it I certainly tell students that if you want to understand the investigations you have to understand the tractatus first. Um, and part of the reason I say that is that that's what Wittgenstein himself thought. Um, originally, when Wittgenstein was in the process of finishing the investigations, remember we, I said you know, he, he left it um, at, when he died. I can't remember, did we talk about this earlier in the interview? But he left the, the investigation yeah. when he died with instructions yeah. um, yeah, for um, it to be published. Yes, of course, we did talk about that. Um, so when he was in, the in this process, he wanted the investigation to be published with the tractators in the same volume. So his original plan was the book he wanted, he actually wanted Cambridge University Press to publish it. It was going to be tractators followed by investigations because he thought to understand investigations, his readers would have to read the tractators first. So he saw the investigations as reacting to um, the tractators, rejecting parts of it. I would say, my own view is not rejecting all of it. I think he thought there were some insights in it that he still thought were valid. Um, I mean, the reason that didn't happen, basically, as far as I know, was just copyright reasons. The point is that tractatus was published by Routledge um, and that wasn't the publisher that he was talking to about the investigations. So um, I do think that you as an undergraduate would have found the investigations easier to understand if you had done the tractatus at that point. Um, 
the 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 quote from my former self that you you helpfully remind me of, I think was probably mainly me just trying to be provocative. But to the extent that it wasn't, I think it was more a comment on the tractatus than, than on the investigations. That's to say, I think that it's quite interesting and illuminating to try to see how many of the arguments that are in the investigations can be understood as variants of views that are already in the in the tractatus. Right. Um, I would say that the one thing that I think there is a clear shift on between tractators and investigations is to do with, is basically atomism. I think that the investigations tries to show that the whole project that leads you to atomism is mistaken. And the way that it does that is through the private language argument. So, Can you summarise that for, for people? Yeah. Um, the private language argument is an argument that, I mean, in its short version, it would say language is, in principle, public. Language is something you learn as a child, you're taught it, you then exhibit it, your understanding, your grasp of language by using that using it the meanings that words have are meanings that in most cases they you know they had they had those meanings before you started using the words they're passed on to you by not by your parents but and more broadly by the linguistic community in which you're embedded so if if in that sense meanings are essentially public there's there's a question then about how you can use words that refer to things that are intrinsically private. Um, so, you know, and then the idea is that in some way, the private language argument aims to show that, that in some sense, that's impossible. That, that lang the criteria for using words are inherently public criteria. So how can you use language to uh, refer to something not just something you happen to be the only person who's experienced it, but something that intrinsically no one else could experience. E.g., the very shade of green that I'm experiencing when I look at the wall, you know, that very shade um, is something that only I am experiencing and only I can experience. You know, this famous problem about colour, you know, one of the things that many people, to many people, is one of the first philosophical questions they ever asked is, I'm sure you remember wondering it as a child, you know, how do I know that what I see as green is the same as what someone else sees as green? Hmm. Yeah, and and uh, so the private language argument says that there's, there's a problem about how to understand that. Now, I, I mentioned Peter Geach um, earlier as a, a commentator on, on Wittgenstein. Another of the things that I think Geech is right about in his writings is Geech stresses the idea that the private language argument is not supposed to be an argument that the inner the, the inner, inner experience just drops out as irrelevant. So, some commentators have read it that way. So, so if you think of something like a pain, a, a funny kind of itch I'm having, you know, right? Uh, or, or just a headache. I mean, a headache is, is an experience that only I, only I can have that experience. Um, some people try to give an exegesis of the private language argument, according to which the headache itself is completely irrelevant to when I say I've got a headache. Now, what's true is that Wittgenstein teetered on the edge of a way of understanding the argument that would have led to that conclusion. If you do go all the way to that conclusion, you find it very hard to resist treating Wittgenstein in the investigations as a behaviorist. So the idea is, if what it means for me to say I have a headache is to be cashed out wholly in terms of publicly 
um, grasp all meanings, it's very hard to resist the idea that what it means is that I'm exhibiting headache-like behavior. Yeah, so just so in other words, the idea would be that I have a headache means something like I'm disposed to take an aspirin or grasp my nose or complain, um, this yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And if that were the right account of the meaning of the word headache or the meaning of the word pain or whatever, then there would be a certain kind of um, faking that would just be ruled out as linguistically impossible. Because if what it means to have a headache is to do one of a quite long disjunction of things such as taking aspirin or, or uh, grasping your nose, um, then it wouldn't make any sense to ask whether I could be doing this stuff and yet not have a headache. Because right, that, that would just be contradictory. Um, now, as I say, Wittgenstein teeters on the edge of that. He says explicitly in the tractate, in the investigations, um, do, do I mean that? He said, no, not that. Right? That's explicit in the text, that he he's trying not to make that mistake. But as I say, it would be easy to read the argument in such a way that it did teeter over in, into that. I think the way of Resisting that is to keep in mind whenever you, when you read the private language argument, always ask, who is this an argument against? Because he introduces it in the book as an argument about someone, you know, making some note in the diary, keeping a diary and writing some funny mark in it to indicate they've had some funny feeling. And your initial thought is, well, this is all very interesting, but which which previous philosopher went about making marks in the diary, you know. Answer, well, Russell. Because Russell's sense datum theory is essentially a private language on. Uh, but that's the idea. The idea is, on Russell's account, my language at its base has, remember, names not of green patches on walls, because I could be mistaken about that, but of green patches in my visual field. That you experience. Intrinsically cannot be experienced by someone else. Their nature yeah. is to be things that only I can have that experience. So the answer, at the first approximation, the target of the private language argument is Russell. And then you ask, well, is it just Russell? Is it also perhaps Wittgenstein's own earlier self, the Wittgenstein of the Fructatus. Well, I think it's not directly an argument against the, the Wittgenstein of the Fructatus because we were talking earlier about what the simple objects are, and the Tractatus doesn't say explicitly that they are patches in your visual field. Um, Just objects. Um, Remember, that the point in the Tractatus is that, in a, a, way, a way of thinking about the difference between Russell and Wittgenstein is that Russell's arguments tend to be bottom-up, Wittgenstein's are top-down. So Russell's argument is, you know, there's a famous passage in Russell's Problems of Philosophy, his so-called Schilling Shocker, his book that he wrote to be a best, popular bestseller, an introduction to philosophy for or non, you know, for non philosophers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's this famous passage that, you know, everyone who's read it will remember where in chapter one he's sitting in his study write, writing and he says, you know, what, as I write, what can I be certain of? What do I see around me? What, what, what's indubitable in experience? And he says, not the desk. You know, I can't be sure about that. What, what's indubitable in my experience is just a brown patch in my visual field. So Russell starts from things like that and works his way up. Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, his argument that there are simple objects goes top down. His argument in the Tractatus is we say things that are determinately true or false about the world. How is it that to be explained? 
and then he has an arg a very brief compressed argument, but just about an argument, so-called argument for substance, whose conclusion is, well, the only way we could do that is if there are simple objects. So then the question, what are the simple objects? Well, that's a separate question, but which he hasn't which he hasn't answered. Um, so um, But certainly the the idea then in philosophical investigations is that that's not anymore the kind of thing he's talking about because you have because then we would be lead, led to some sort of solipsism and seems to be some kind of private language going on there which he then wants to say no to so one way you mentioned is well then is he got some kind of behaviorism going on where then it's not about our private experiences but it's about something public like our behavior that we can each experience but then he disowns that you said at least explicitly so what, what then are you left with in philosophical investigations? Um, I think what you're left with is principally, and rather disappointingly, negative. It's an argument that a certain approach to the problem, namely what I've called the bottom-up approach, is wrong. So I think that the, the key... Thing that's being claimed in the private language argument is that the method Russell had used is an incorrect method. Now, but then one realizes actually, is it just Russell that's the target? Answer no, because what should chapter one of Problems of Philosophy remind you of when Russell's sitting there in his study asking, What am I saying? Exactly so, yes. It's the, Carte the whole Cartesian tradition of which Russell is the main modern uh, example. Um, it's that whole tradition which the private language argument is trying to show is mistaken. So the conclusion is supposed to be, I think, not that <laughs> your pain drops out as completely irrelevant. It's not that you can't fake, it, that it's linguistically meaningless to, to talk about a perfect faker, someone who's so good at pretending to have headaches that you can't tell when they're faking or not. Um, it, 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 what it is supposed to be an argument against is a certain conception of how to think about privacy. What, how we should understand the notion of the privacy of the mental and how, crucially, how we should understand the notion of certainty. Um, in his very late work, you know, in, in the period when he was by then dying of, of prostate cancer, it, um, he wrote these notes published later as Uncertainty. Um, notes which have that feature I mentioned earlier of because they're just notes he, he, that he never finished. They are of uneven quality, but they're fascinating. And the parts that are of good quality are, are really do help you to rethink some issues. But the key point there is, how should we understand the notion of certainty? The Cartesian idea is that what you are most certain of is things like green patches in your visual field, or famously in Descartes, that you exist. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> the private language argument, if it's, if it's anything close to right, shows that that whole understanding is wrong. So the, the key rug it pulls from under you is the idea that certainty starts inside and works its way, way out, and that you're, more, you're less and less certain as things get further away from you. Hmm. And what the private language argument and then the notes on publishers on certainty do is just reconfigure that. They do turn that inside out. So they, they reconfigure your whole idea of what certainty is. What I don't think they do is to reconfigure whole, your whole idea of what a headache feels like. That stays resolutely, you know, <laughs> the same as yeah. it always did. So, so what, what, what is then a kind of a, a paradigmatic example of something you could be certain of under the new way of thinking? In uncertainty, he calls them hinge propositions. Hinge propositions are propositions that 
are part of the framework for a discussion so that you can't doubt them without undermining the, the very frame for the, for the discussion. Now, one would initially think, oh, well, that's things like can't, can't synthetic a priori. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting about uncertainty is that Wittgenstein gives examples there of so-called hinge propositions that are, aren't synthetic a priori on anybody's understanding. Example things which are straightforwardly empirical. Empirical, so, did you say? Empirical, yeah. So right. an example, um, he uses the example, no one's ever been to the moon. Which, of course, was, was true in 1950, 51. Yeah. Um, now false, because at least if, like me, you, you don't believe the conspiracy theorists who think they were, the moon landings were faked in a... Hmm. In a warehouse in is it Texas or somewhere? There? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, a part of the internet. I just don't visit. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's an example of a hinge proposition. So um, how can that be a hinge proposition? Given that, well, it was just an empirical fact that no one had been to the moon by 1951, and later people did go to the moon. Well, the answer is because. If in 1950 you had tried to um, hypothesize that someone had been to the moon, you just ask, well, tell me more about this. this How could this have happened? And just more and more about your understanding of the world would have to be unraveled. There's too much of your understanding of the world that would have to be wrong. Um, so I mean to give another example um, I am now sitting in my study okay? that's an empirical fact as it happens I'm sitting in my study because I we arranged to do this interview here but I might not have been I might have forgotten about the interview and gone for a walk or something how do I know that I'm sitting in my study could I coherently doubt that I'm sitting in my study. If I start trying to tell a story according to which I'm not now sitting in my study, too much else that I take myself to be certain of would have to come into question. So, you know, you say, well, suppose I was kidnapped last night while I was asleep, drugged, taken to a replica of my study, um, built somewhere else but it wouldn't just be a replica of my study because i can see the street outside so someone would have to build a replica of my street somewhere in britain close enough to my home to be taken to last night how how did they manage that Hmm. how did they manage that without me reading in a newspaper that someone had built a replica you know it, eventually, the story just crumbles under its own weight. But would that so? This, would that mean? Because so I haven't. I, mean, I know I said I did a paper on it, but I had. Um, I, it was a long time ago. I was a fresh undergrad, so I don't feel like I know that much about investigations. But it seems to me then that those hinge propositions or those propositions you could be most certain about might look very different in different um ages and times um and for example the moon the moon landing yeah. is one and nowadays with our technology it becomes much easier to change to, to give an example of how you could be mistaken about things because you can use simulations or whatever but even if you go back into the past if they say were a very uh, like a very religious community and the idea of, of, of a pantheon of gods is so integrated into their entire way of seeing and understanding the world then their what they were certain of would be very different to what we might be certain of. And so is that kind of where Wittgenstein talks about language games? Is there a connection there between... Yes, there is. Um, of course, it, 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 you're right. This is all very uh, relevant to, to modern debates. Um, I was just watching a TV series called The Capture, on which I, you may have seen, which is precisely about the idea of faking things um, so effectively that that people are are radically taken in by them. 
Um, I think these, it's important for us all to think about issues like that. But the idea in in uncertainty. Is, so the background here is that Wittgenstein is starting by reflecting on Moore's famous anti-skeptical argument. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the idea being that. Um, I, his idea is that, that I can't question, I can't coherently doubt that, he, that this is a hand without doubting so much else that my whole worldview collapses. So that the idea is that, that, that it's simply incoherent in a certain way to, to doubt that, 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 that this is a hand. But of course, the, that this is a hand, that's an empirical fact, you know, I mean, if I put my hands behind my back and say, here is a hand, well, no, it isn't, right? So it's just an empirical fact that, that, that here is a hand. Um, so that's an example of a hinge proposition, something that that may be empirical, but nonetheless is something that you can't doubt without um, the rug being pulled from under your whole understanding. So it sounds to me that, sorry, I mean, so it sounds to me that the, the, that's a very big difference between Tractatus and philosophical investigations, because the Tractatus is very atomistic. I mean, you mentioned atomism, they've changed, but it's, it's atomistic in terms of meaning, that if you analyze uh, our, uh, sentences, you get down to these logical names, and then in the propositions, they name these sort of fundamental, simple objects. Um, whereas this is now taking a much more holistic idea of, of meaning and of thinking that, well, Yes, you might. If you if you think you can just pull this certain experience separately or a certain belief separately, can I just doubt this belief? Well, now you can't doubt that belief without having to tell a new story about what's outside the window, etc. So it's seeing language as much more interconnected into a whole kind of way of viewing the world, or a whole series of propositions and inferences that are related. And um, it's almost like I mean, obviously, Frege's context principle takes it at the level of sentences, but this is almost b- broader than that. It sounds. And this is yeah. leading to, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's intended to be an argument against global scepticism. It's not an argument against certain kinds of very local scepticism. But um, if you want an example of a variant of this argument, look at Hilary Putnam, who is famous for his brains in a vat argument, which is an argument against global scepticism. And the idea of all such arguments, they all have the same pattern. It's that um, the skeptic can't even express the, the skeptical view that they're trying to get you to consider because the words they use are words that presuppose, that got their meaning from the presupposition of an external world. So you can't uh, express the view. So the mistake made by most kinds of anti-skeptical argument on this view is to offer arguments. That's to say, to treat the skeptical view as something that makes sense and has to be refuted. And the view that, that Putnam is trying to express in Reason, Truth and History um, is that the view that you're supposed to be trying to argue against doesn't even make sense. So it's another example of what we were talking about much earlier, which is um, the, the the feature that the Tractatus um, exhibits of arguments which are not proofs by contradiction. They're proofs that something leads to nonsense. Mm. The idea is that the sceptical view leads to nonsense. So the right yeah. way to treat it is just to show how it crumbles so it's not even a position that should be argued against yeah and there, there, there seems some shades of, sort of transcendental arguments with that approach as well and i suppose what you're trying to do is well exactly i mean the reason truth and history it, it is a transcendental argument exactly yeah. As that yeah 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 okay very interesting so well his language games is, is a very sort of famous idea in philosophical investigations and it gets applied to lots of different areas could you say a little bit about um about what he means in talks about a language game and and how that's quite different to the idea of logical languages having reference with bits of them and that sort of thing yeah 
So you know, I said that the investigations is rejecting some bits of Tractatus, but maybe not rejecting as many as some commentators think. But this is one point on which undoubtedly he shifted from Tractatus. Because the argument for the solipsism in the Tractatus is an argument whose key working part is the claim that there is such, such a thing as the language the language which alone I understand. Um, famously mistranslated in the first English edition, which with the translation by Ramsey, um, uh, for some reason Wittgenstein didn't spot when he checked the translation um, that it, it, the translation would come out as the language which I alone understand. So the German is die allein ich verstehe, which alone I understand. Mm. And Ramsey had made that which I alone understand. So it sounds, if translated as which I alone understand, it sounds as if he's talking about a language which I'm the only person who understands. It would be a private language. Right? Mm. It's not. It's the language which is the only language that I understand. So yeah. the idea is that, that the key working part of the Tractatus argument is that there is such a thing as language. Right? I confront the world with language as a single unified thing. That's the, the view which investigation rejects um, because of a, very, a set of, of arguments in the first part of the book which have tried to show that that view <coughs> can't work. So what replaces it is the notion of a language game. So instead of the language which alone I understand, what I have is a patchwork of sub-languages, or language games, a patchwork of practices, each of which has its own um, rules, its own way of understanding. But there is no such thing in the point of investigations as a single unified whole which all my language games share. So there's no one thing called language. There's just uh, uh, language is now a, a, um, a cluster concept um, or family resemblance concept. Is the mm. Can you give some ideas of how that might work, just sort of help make it a little bit clearer? So let, let's say that, um, well, you've got different interests. So you, you, you like trains and you like philosophy. Um, and I'm sure you have other interests as well that I don't know about. And, and each of these sorts of domains of interest can come with their own vocabulary, uh, the sort of thing that you'd say in a, in, in a train enthusiast meeting would be different to the sort of thing you'd say at you know, the Moral Sciences Club or something. Um, and we've, we've talked personally as well about sometimes how, as a philosopher, especially a relatively highly trained one, how you can communicate to the person on the street some of these ideas in a way that makes sense to them. So is this an example of different language games? And if so, how do these different parts that may be in some ways that you can speak these different kinds of languages and the different sort of social things that go on with them. How does that sort of work as a, as a, as a theory, how they can be different, but together? Um, the answer in the investigations is that what binds them all together is something he calls our form of life. Then the problem is, well, what does he mean by a form of life? And I think his idea is that, in some sense, that's unsayable. So one of the controversies about the investigations is whether our form of life is just supposed to be the kind of thing that an anthropologist could tell you. Is it supposed to be just, what are human practices? Give us a list. And an anthropologist could go and study some community and compile a list which, the more they observe the community, the more comprehensible list we get and eventually they would have studied the the community in detail and you'd have a list and say right that's that's what our form of life is it's just it's what we do as humans and here's a description of it um my own view is that i don't think that is what he means by a form of life because i think one of the things i think he's still carrying forward from the tractatus is the idea that at some point you get to what's unsayable. You know, he, he used the metaphor of, of digging and reaching bedrock. You know, this, 
he says, our spade turns. You can't, you get to a point where you can't go any further. Um, I think that idea that at some point explanation stops and you're left just having to shrug your shoulders and not say anymore, that's an idea that's in the Tractatus. I think that idea is still there, I mean, differently configured, but it's still there in some way in the investigations. So, right. so the answer to your question, I think, in the investigation is that um, there's going to be a point when you can't really say what it is that unites all these language games and makes them collectively um, what's distinctive about your community. So he certainly wouldn't think then there was some kind of meta language at work that we can sort of ascend to and, and talk about them. Uh, right. in, yeah, okay. Because I, th I think that if he did say that, then he would flip into transcendental idealism again. Does he does does the philosophical investigation suffer from the same problem we discussed earlier, the Tractatus? Then that in a way, because he is talking about language games, that if you get to the end, you realise he's trying to talk in a neutral way about all language games and how this works, and so he you may have to see that as a ladder that has to be got rid of as well. Or does that not happen with investigations? It doesn't happen explicitly. I mean, he doesn't use the. He doesn't recommend you to chuck the book away in quite the way that he does in the Tractatus. But I would say that the problem remains. I, I think his recognition of the problem remains. I think he still recognises the threat of transcendental idealism and he's still trying not to fall into it. But it's less clear in the investigations what his strategy is, I think, for avoiding it. Um, I mean, the other threat, of course, is that there is a way of trying to understand it which seems to lead to, to a kind of relativism. Because if what unites my language games is my form of life, and what unites yours is your form of life, and if your form of life is different from mine, isn't there a danger that we're not that when we dispute we're not really disagreeing? You can just say, "Well, that you have your truth, I have my truth." Yeah. Now, I don't think it does lead to that relativism because I think that two things. First of all, your form of life and my form of life are plainly similar enough. But there's a huge amount of commonality such that we can understand each other so that I can just say, no, you're wrong, Nathan, right? As I have, of course, at various times in the past. <laughs> yes. Mainly about Frigg. But, um, you know, we do share enough. And I think that that can be a starting point. And I think for Wittgenstein, that was a starting point. But just as in the Tractatus, his transcendental argument in the Tractatus for the Existence of Simples, the, the substance takes as its premise that we say things true or false about the world. I think in the same way in the investigations, he thinks we can take as a starting point that we do understand each other a lot of the time. So these, but, are, not, these are not ultimately incommensurable, but there, there may be degrees of incommensurability. So would, would, would it be the case that if you talk to someone maybe from a different period of time, if that were possible, or, or from a, a very different culture, there will be those uh, certain degree of incommensurability. Or maybe, like as we said before, uh, if you or I were trying to talk about uh, philosophy of language issues or, or metaphysical issues to just my children or just someone who's not, uh, that, that it, is, it makes communication difficult? I don't know. I don't know where the cutoff point is. Yeah. Well, two things. I don't know where Wittgenstein thought the cutoff point was, and secondly, I don't know where I think the cutoff point is. I mean, the the datum we've got from Wittgenstein is his famous remark that if a lion could speak, we wouldn't understand it. Yeah. Why not? Answer: Because the form of life of a lion is too different from the form of life of a human. Um, so, hang on. so this form of life it sounds to me quite similar to something else we talked about before which is almost like just the experience 
the kind of what it is like to be a lion. But but she, presumably, form of life is it something broader than that? Um, be, no, no. Because I think be, as a starting point, yeah, it's what it's like to what it's like to be human, as opposed to what it's like to be a lion. Or yeah, I mean, here's an example example that might help. I remember once seeing a television program which tried to show what the world looked like to a cow. And the, the makers of this program seemed to be impressed by the fact that cows can't see straight ahead because their eyes are on either side. So what they did was they took a camera looking that way and a camera looking that way, and they put them both on screen with a blurring, blurred bit in between. And they said, there, that's what the world looks like to a cow. And I thought, when I watched this program, whatever the world looks like to a cow, I'm sure it's not that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Well, because what's salient in the world to a cow isn't what's salient to us. So I don't know what the world looks like to a cow, but I'm guessing that things like, you know, grass is probably pretty salient in its worldview. Certain other things probably aren't salient at all. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, but of course, the, you know, at this point, I'll stop talking because I, I'm not a, you know, I'm, I, I don't do the, the, the physiology of vision. So I'm not an expert on that. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to tread on things I mean know nothing about. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a familiar fact that huge amounts of data get sent from our eyes into the brain, vast majority of which just gets chucked away. Mm. And there are lots, you know, there are lots of experiments on how much of what is sent from the eye just doesn't register. Um, so presumably, it, it's similar but different in the case of cows. Right? Mm, mm. So that's why we just do, we don't know what what's salient in the world to a cow ditto with a lion and that's why if a lion could speak we wouldn't understand it mm, mm. And that's why there is a fundamental mistake in Doctor Who you know the premise of Doctor Who is that the Doctor has a, a clever device that does kind of simultaneous Google Translate so when he lands on on a distant planet, he can understand all the beings. I think Star Trek has something similar, the universal yeah. translator. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's just an important mistake embedded in that because if we could land on one of these distant planets, we wouldn't understand the beings on that planet hmm. because what's salient in the world to them wouldn't be what's salient to us. And that's actually an important mistake because there is a kind of thought experiment some philosophers encourage us to do, which is the Martian thought experiment. You know, the how would a Martian understand our language? So we, we, we posit this helpful being who can observe our practices and try to interpret them, although they're not part of those practices. That's what the, the role of Martian plays in these thought experiments. And whenever I see those thought experiments, I always think, hang on, isn't there just a problem here <laughs> that, that the, the thought experiment is supposed to um, treat it as relatively unproblematic that the Martian can make some kind of understanding of what we're doing. Mm. Seems, at least according to Wittgenstein, that's problematic. Mm. So doesn't this, uh, so I don't know too much about his views on religion, but the little bits that I do know, it sounds like it's in somewhere in this territory that he would sort of see religion as its own language game. So there's, in a religious context, you might talk about similar things, but you'd use different language. You've got a different sort of framework within which to talk about or understand these issues. Because um, I certainly seem to think that whenever I have looked at, say, uh, religious apologists against, um, say, sort of dogmatic atheism, there's a lot of talking past each other or this assumption that there's this very easy way to just translate from one thing to the other. And, um, and Wittgenstein had something to say about that. Could you say a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, yes, he does. Um, I should say that in 
the literature that discusses his later views on religion, one of the big points of controversy is how he is supposed to have thought the religious language game or games, depending on which kind of religion you follow, interact with other language games. So um, one of the concerns people have about a Wittgensteinian understanding of religion as language ga- a language game is a kind of dilemma that says either the language game of religion is connected with ordinary, the language games <coughs> we play of ordinarily describing empirical stuff around the world, or it isn't. If it is um, connected, then can't we just translate the, langu- the religious language game into the vocabulary of the empirical language game, in which case religion just becomes, you know, just dissolves in, in a certain way. Or it's not translatable, but if it's not translatable, it's just an autonomous language game, in which case, what's the point? It, it just becomes a, a, a kind of harmless spare time activity that if, if you feel like it, you can go into a church and you can recite the creed and you can listen to the, the nice music. But the words of the creed are part of a language game that has absolutely nothing to do with anything else in your in your world. So when you leave the church, nothing that you said in the church makes any kind of sense outside that context. In which case you've just, you've sealed religion in a kind of hermetically sealed box. So it has no connection with the the rest of the world. And so there is that that tension. And then again, as with many things in Wittgenstein, it's not at all clear exactly how we're, he thinks we're supposed to resolve that tension. So there's a genuine problem there. Um, mm. So... Um, but could it, so, could it, could it be um, so interesting then with that? So uh, uh, does he think of, sort of, say, ethical language as its own language game, because presumably if you start to you to talk in terms of ethics, that doesn't necessarily translate, or does he think it does translate into empirical language? Because it seems as though what you're talking about when you discuss values or ethics uh, is something a little bit different to when you're talking just about, you know, the colour of books or whatever you might think of as an, an empirical observation. Well, in the lecture on ethics from 1929, he makes a distinction between absolute and relative value. And his idea there is that um, when he said in the Tractatus that value was inexpressible, value being one of these things that in the sixes of the Tractatus he has to, you know, is a putative synthetic a priori and that he has to show is, is actually nonsense. He clarifies in 1929 to say, that what he meant there was that it's absolute value that is inexpressible. So what he's doing most clearly in the lecture on ethics is effectively pushing the Humean fact value distinction to its logical conclusion and saying that there's fact and there's value. They're just different things. Value is unsayable. Um, whenever I say something that looks as if it's an expression of absolute value, but which isn't unsaid, which is perfectly sayable, the explanation will always be actually what I said was really just relative value. So the idea is that if you say killing babies is wrong, there are two ways of understanding that. On the relative interpretation, it just means something within the ordinary circle of empirical stuff about the world, such as, well, if, if you do, you'll probably get locked up, right? Mm-hmm. So you could have a perfectly consequentialist understanding of relative value, uh, and there's nothing Wittgenstein says that, that would object to that. But if, you, if all you meant was, well, if you kill a baby, you, you're likely to get locked up, people will say, well, that's not what you really mean by killing babies is wrong, right? You mean it's really wrong. And what Wittgenstein holds in the lecture on ethics is that what you mean by saying it's really wrong is just something inexpressible. It's that 
it's just part of your worldview that you look at the world through that lens. So a way of putting it would be that according to Wittgenstein the Tractatus, and then still in 1929, um, if you ask the question, should you, you know, should you help the old lady across the road, let's say, there are two things you might mean about, by the should there. The relative thing is just, well, it might grat might give you a bit of gratification, might make you, you, you feel a little, a little bit better, that's an empirical consequence. But that's not about ethics in any deep sense. That's just what makes you happy um, in an empirical sense. But the absolute question, should you help the old lady across the road, the answer to that is, it doesn't matter whether you help the old lady across the road in an absolute sense. All that matters is that whatever you do, whether you help her across the road or not, you do it in the right spirit. So the idea is that the absolute view is just a way of a way of thinking about the world. It's as it were that I mean the, the way the, the metaphor in the Tractatus, of course, is he talks about the world waxing and waning as a whole. Um, and the idea seems to be um, that well, the world of the happy. He he talks about the the the, the, the fortunate or happy person. Um, the world of the happy waxes and wanes as a whole. It means that the world of the happy is just kind of a brighter world. It's just more vivid. It, it glows more brightly, as it were. It's not that the, the facts are different for the happy person. It's just that they seem better. So it's just a way of looking at the world as a whole that makes it seem a better place. Mm. And, so, and this is something that, 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 that carries on into his later remarks about religion, it's that throughout, he wants to reject any conception of religion that thinks of it as God intervening in the world. He's just never, he always thought that that was a mistaken view. So he would have no truck with the notion of a miracle as being, you know, making stuff move. Um, what he would have truck with is the idea of a miracle as a way of understanding the world. So this feeling of safety he had way back in 1909, I said earlier, you know, it wasn't a feeling that says that you could cross the road without looking. That would just be silly. When you feel this feeling of complete safety, it's not empirical safety. It's just a feeling about the world as a whole, that, that mm. some way it's, it feels it's a good world it, or something. Mm. So throughout, he rejects the God intervening model, but he's always throughout his career interested in the idea of God as a way of trying to uh, express what's ultimately inexpressible, namely the value you see in the world as a well. whole. So is it, yeah, okay, so a little bit more on this. And uh, to be honest, I think it could be interesting to, to take quite a few of the different themes that we've sort of brushed over and gone over quite quickly in this video. And we could, you know, we could easily talk about them on their own. And maybe we will, if you've got the time for it at some point, Michael. Um, but OK, so just, just to sort of wrap this bit up, is he suggesting that uh, his view of religion is sort of religion at its best or kind of a religion when it works or, or, or the role that it might have is in this sort of uh, bigger way of maybe trying to put into words that which is ultimately unsayable, but we give it some kind of form. Or is he saying, no, that is what religion actually does, or that is what whether or not religion, people who engage in religion think that's what they're talking about. And I'll tell you a bit of the reason why I'm interested in this, um, and it's a bit related to stuff on the channel, is that um, it, it, it seems to me that in the 19th century anyway, the dominant views of, of religion that I think have carried over uh, had maybe to try and be relevant had adopted a, a view that it was quite scientific in, in terms of its meaning, that, that when claims are made in the religious language that they could be verified or, or understood in the same way as, say, a scientific claim. And it was that kind of religion that got very much shaken uh, in the 19th century. But, but what you're saying here is Wittgenstein seems to be suggesting that maybe even some of the adherents of religion had misunderstood 
what it was they were engaged in and what it was they were doing. Um, so yeah, as he sort of... That's right. He talked about the, the God intervening stuff he called superstition. Um, and there are some remarks he made about, uh, I think, a radio talk he'd heard by someone called Father O'Hara, who had talked about religion as this thing, which, which Wittgenstein labeled as superstition. And I'm pretty sure he meant the word superstition there to have a pejorative um, connotation. Um, so I think his position is slightly sort of halfway between the two positions. So I don't think he's saying no one in the history of the world has ever had an understanding of religion that's, that, 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 I, that I, Wittgenstein, would characterize as superstition. That would be crazy. He recognizes that there are people who have that view, but he does think that there's more room for the alternative view than, than many have thought. And the place where he says that is in his remarks on the Golden Bough. So this is this big work of, of anthropology, uh, which is kind of classic of uh, uh, study of, of religions in people's past. So Fraser's Golden Bough describes lots of religious practices from all over the world and discusses them. Wittgenstein was fascinated by it and made various notes about it. In particular, there's a passage where Fraser talks about a people in the Nile Delta who worshipped a god, a rain god called Matakodu. And Wittgenstein is very struck by the description offered of this practice because it's presented as being that these people think the rain god makes it rain. But Fraser himself acknowledges that... Sorry, who, what acknowledges, sorry? Fraser, the, the writer of this book, the oh, right. acknowledges that um, they don't pray to the rain god during the dry season. They only pray to the rain god to make it rain at the point in the year when it's due to rain anyway. But plainly, their lives would go better if it rained earlier in the year because they have an agrarian economy which depends on rain. So Wittgenstein picks up on that and says, therefore, it's just too crude to say they think the rain god makes it rain. Because if they yeah. did, they'd pray, pray earlier. So... Mm. What Wittgenstein is suggesting is that in the case of religion, our ascription of belief has to be much subtler. The normal account of belief is something like, you know, Kripke's famous disquotational principle that, you know, if I sincerely assent to P, then I believe that P. Well, in the case of religion, you just can't do it that straightforwardly, according to Wittgenstein. Mm. So... To find out what someone's religious beliefs are, you don't, you can't just ask them. I mean, I mean, to give you an example. There are people who say they believe in the literal truth of the creed, and that they'll say, "I've heard people say, you know, I believe literally in the truth of the creed." And you say, "Really? Yes." But hang on, one of the bits of the creed is um, he descended into hell. Literally, to descend means to move downwards. Now, no one believes that hell is down there. You know, they don't think that he descended into hell means that. So these people don't believe in the literal truth of that bit of the creed. Yeah. What they do believe, well, that's complicated, you know. But the point is you can't just read it off straightforwardly from what they say. Um, yeah. Because you can't straightforwardly read off from what the people of the Nile Delta say that they believe that Matakodu makes it rain. They, if you asked them, they probably would have said, yes, I believe Matakodu makes it rain. But what they meant by that is is more complicated. And it's related to the language game in which yeah. it exists and their way of life, etc., and everything. So you have to take the sort of more holistic view, really. And, and so what that does to me then is it, 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 um, it rather than just sort of 
separating out the way the world is here, the meaning of words here, and then truth, true and falsity conditions for the relationship between the two, as we might do in, in say, formal semantics. Wittgenstein is wanting to sort of see them all as interrelated and also connected with things that we do and not just things that we say and think and believe. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we could easily talk about this for a lot longer. I think um, just time-wise, there's just one other little area that I thought we could talk about a little bit, um, which um, I'll, I'll roll them into one and we'll just see where it goes for a bit. So there's this famous sentence about um, showing the fly out of the fly bottle, or that's what his sort of understanding of, of philosophy is and does. So there's that element there, which is which is a relatively, well, it could, it could be seen as uh saying that this is an important role philosophy has to play and, and, and praising philosophy, or it could be seen as a little bit of a pejorative thing of you're not reaching truth, you're just dealing with misconceptions or something. But also uh, something that even the little that I did engage in investigations um, rose, raised as questions for me is that, and this may come back to whether or not Wittgenstein should be seen as an analytic philosopher or not, but analytic philosophy has continued after Wittgenstein in a way that kind of completely ignores uh, any of those problems and, and the metaphysics that you do um, in the analytic tradition, the type that I involved in, still very much uh, is tied up with notions of simple logical theories with semantics. You read off your ontology from the domain of objects you have, this kind of thing, which is obviously something that Wittgenstein is criticizing. But there doesn't seem to be that much, when I did uh, metaphysics, there doesn't seem to be much attempt to justify the method or the way of doing metaphysics. Can you say a little bit about, about, about that? Um, I know that's quite broad, but I, and I honestly have no idea what you think about it. <laughs> um, I, well, first of all, so I wish Hugh Mellor was here to, to yeah. join us in this conversation. Cause I, I know what, I think I know what he would say about serious metaphysics. Um, yeah. I think that, this is an example of the shame of compartmentalization, that philosophy is a less compartmentalized discipline than many academic disciplines, but it is becoming more compartmentalized. And I think that that's a shame because I think that um, I would like it to be the case that people who do serious metaphysics showed some sensitivity to an awareness of the kind of difficulties that Wittgenstein, for example, uh, raises. More generally, I think that's part of what I think is the justification for doing the kind of history of analytic philosophy that I do. Um, yeah. Because I've had a just a consistent experience over many years that, you know, I'll, I'll go to a, a talk, um, a, a seminar where someone talks about some area of philosophy and in the question period, I'll ask a question that isn't me being clever. It's just me asking what I think is the obvious question that anyone would ask who'd read Frege or Russell or Wittgenstein or Ramsey or Kant or whoever. Hmm. And again and again, I find that you know, well-known philosophers who uh, are, have are well who have achieved fame for arguing certain kind of positions are completely floored by these questions. And I say, this isn't me being brilliant. This is me just asking questions that show some knowledge of the history of the subject. Um, well, maybe there's a different language game going on in contemporary analytic metaphysics. Um, because it's certainly because a similar thing, what led me, I, I, you may know, I think you know, but when I started off my PhD thesis, it was actually on uh, Schaffer's monism. I remember um, Yeah, and the debate there the question of whether or not reality was ultimately one came down to these same sort of uh, how how many objects are in your domain, how do you get parsimonious semantics for our logical system? It's purely about the concrete world. And when I and and I was engaging with it, and I just thought this just takes too much for granted already. This is already operating within an assumption about how we should answer these questions. And when I looked at Bradley, I found that it, that wasn't the way he was approaching the question. Um, and it um, and similarly when I first talked to Timothy Williamson about the question um, because I'd had an offer at Oxford. He, again, straight away launched into this, well, what would your logic look like if you only had one object in your domain and then sort of went on from there? Um, and yeah, for me, it, 
there were questions about the nature of truth, the nature of existence that brought me then to Frege and the kind of the birth of analytic philosophy. And I think what is beautiful uh, about looking at uh, the early analytics and this sort of um, time where it was being formed is that those questions are in the mix because they're aware of Kant and they're aware of, of of sort of the idealist background and and this sort of stuff. So you have this much broader way of thinking about these things. Yes, um, I think, I, and I think that's valuable. I think that it's very important in philosophy to see the limitations of the method one's using, and part of the way to see the those limitations is to know a bit about the history of the subject to see where the current debates came from. And many of the current debates that are live in analytic philosophy today emerge from the period that I'm mostly interested in, you know, late 19th, early 20th century, when these great figures started to think about them. And so I think that um, there's a there's a real danger to doing philosophy if one isn't sensitive to, to that to that history. That's why I, I think it's so important that in places like Cambridge we we treat history seriously and we encourage yeah. our students, yeah. as you know, to do undergraduate papers and then as graduate students to, to, to develop their understanding so that they understand where whichever question they happen to be in doing their research or where it comes from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. Okay, so that's a little bit then, it sounds like um, analytic philosophy has sort of just continued on regardless, uh, picked up maybe a little bit more of the idealized idea of what Frege and Russell might have been trying to do, uh, maybe even more Russell than Frege, um, and then and then a bit of Quinean ontology in there or something, and we've got uh, where, where uh, metaphysics seems to be today. So um, that, that's not a topic of conversation, although it'd be an interesting one. Um, but how then does this, does does Wittgenstein conceive of what philosophy is is and does um, in terms of like this showing the fly out of the fly bottle uh, metaphor that he uses? And we'll end on that. And so you you, can, you have the final word, <laughs> and then I'll just say goodbye. Um, I think that the central idea in all of Wittgenstein's writings is that we sh whenever we look at one of these big de famous debates in philosophy, Wittgenstein's method is almost always to defuse the debate by showing that it was based on a misunderstanding. So the method that we saw in the Tractatus of showing that a certain question dissolves into nonsense, this dissolving idea is the thing that's a continuous thread through his philosophy. So similarly, what's wrong with the Cartesian sitting wondering what he's certain of in experience? Well, the answer is not so much that you know that the um, that Descartes' argument, um, you know, that the cogito is wrong. It's that its starting point is misconceived. Right? His argument is you shouldn't start by sitting there, you know, wondering what you're certain of in experience. Because of course you are certain that there's an external world. So start with that. So Descartes just starting from the wrong place. So m much of Wittgenstein's philosophy is an example of the, you know, the old joke of when someone asks for directions and you say, well, I wouldn't start from here, you know. Start from <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that's um, that's been very interesting, very productive. Um, and thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me about Wittgenstein, Michael. I'm sure people really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, it's been fun.